Welcome to the Huberman Lab Podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. My guest today is David Goggins. David Goggins is a retired Navy SEAL who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's also a highly accomplished ultramarathon runner. For those of you that don't know, ultramarathons are distances longer than 26 miles, and in David's case, often longer than 200 miles. For his achievements in athletics, he has been inducted into the International Sports Hall of Fame. He also held a Guinness World Record for the most pull-ups completed in 24 hours. I should mention that not only was David a decorated Navy SEAL, but he also graduated from Army Ranger School. David is also a highly successful writer having authored two books, the first entitled Can't Hurt Me and the second entitled Never Finished, both of which are bestsellers. David's books cover many topics, including his autobiographical description of what can only be described as an incredibly challenging child and young adulthood. His home was abusive, his school environment was abusive, he essentially had no positive resources directed his way. And in his 20s, he found himself to be obese, that is more than 300 pounds, working a job he despised for minimal pay. And it was at that point that David began an inner dialogue that forced him to explore the demons born out of his childhood, but also the position that he found himself in as a young man. And then began the journey to navigate that dialogue and transform himself into the Navy SEAL, the ultramarathon runner, the best-selling author, and the extraordinarily positive and influential man that he is today. As some of you may know, David has done various public lectures. He's a familiar face online because there are so many clips of him on YouTube, and he has done podcasts before. However, I'm certain that you'll find today's discussion to be very different than previous podcasts that David has been featured on. The reason is that, of course, we get into his accomplishments. We talk about the mindset that allowed him to achieve those things. But today, David really lets us under the hood. He lets us into the form of inner dialogue that he has to embrace, indeed, that he has to grapple with on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times throughout the day and night, in order to impose the sort of self-discipline that he is so well known for. We also get into some of the scientific mechanisms underlying willpower, and we talk about David's current endeavors that include, for instance, his own exploration of science and medicine, for which he has become an intense scholar and practitioner. I should mention that multiple times throughout today's discussion, you will hear curse words. Now, David and I both acknowledge that cursing isn't for everybody, and that cursing itself is different than cursing at somebody. Nonetheless, we do realize that many people, parents perhaps especially, might not want to hear cursing. If you don't want to hear cursing, well then, this podcast episode is probably not for you. However, if you are comfortable with cursing or if you can tolerate it, I assure you today's discussion is highly worthwhile. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is Maui Nui Venison. Maui Nui Venison is the most nutrient-dense and delicious red meat available. I've spoken before on this podcast, and there's general consensus that most people should strive to consume approximately one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Now, when one strives to do that, it's important to maximize the quality of that protein intake to the calorie ratio, because you don't want to consume an excess of calories when trying to get that one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Maui Nui Venison has an extremely high quality protein to calorie ratio, so it makes getting that one gram of protein per pound of body weight extremely easy. It's also delicious. Personally, I like the ground venison. I also like the venison steaks. And then for convenience, when I'm on the road, I like the jerky. The jerky is a very high protein to calorie ratio. So it has as much as 10 grams of protein per jerky stick, and it has something like only like 55 calories. So again, making it very easy to get enough protein without consuming excess calories. If you would like to try Maui Nui Venison, you can go to MauiNuiVenison.com slash Huberman to get 20% off your first order. Again, that's MauiNuiVenison.com slash Huberman to get 20% off. Today's episode is also brought to us by AeroPress. AeroPress is similar to a French press for making coffee, but is in fact 
a much better way to make coffee. I first learned about AeroPress well over 10 years ago, and I've been using one ever since. AeroPress was developed by Alan Adler, who was an engineer at Stanford. And I knew of Alan because he had also built the so-called Aerobi Frisbee, which I believe at one time, perhaps still now, held the Guinness Book of World Records for furthest thrown object. And I used to see Alan, believe it or not, at parks around Palo Alto, testing out different Aerobi Frisbees. So he was sort of famous in our community for developing these different feats of engineering that turned into commercial products. Now, I love coffee. I'm somebody that drinks coffee nearly every day, usually about 90 to 120 minutes after I wake up in the morning, although not always. Sometimes if I'm going to exercise, I'll drink coffee first thing in the morning. But I love, love, love coffee. And what I've personally found is that by using the AeroPress, I can make the best possible tasting cup of coffee. I don't know what exactly it is in the AeroPress that allows the same beans to be prepared into a cup of coffee that tastes that much better as compared to any other form of brewing that coffee, even the traditional French press. The AeroPress is extremely easy to use and it's extremely compact. In fact, I take it with me whenever I travel and I use it on the road in hotels, even on planes. I'll just ask for some hot water and I'll brew my coffee or tea right there on the plane. If you'd like to try AeroPress, you can go to aeropress.com slash Huberman. That's A-E-R-O-P-R-E-S-S dot com slash Huberman to get 20% off any AeroPress coffee maker. AeroPress ships anywhere in the USA, Canada, and over 60 other countries around the world. Again, that's aeropress.com slash Huberman to get 20% off. Today's episode is also brought to us by 8Sleep. 8Sleep makes smart mattress covers with cooling, heating, and sleep tracking capacity. I've spoken many times before on this podcast about the fact that sleep is the foundation of mental health, physical health, and performance. Now, a key component of getting a great night's sleep is that in order to fall and stay deeply asleep, your body temperature actually has to drop by about one to three degrees. And in order to wake up feeling refreshed and energized, your body temperature actually has to increase by about one to three degrees. One of the best ways to make sure that those temperature changes occur at the appropriate times, at the beginning and throughout, and at the end of your night when you wake up, is to control the temperature of your sleeping environment. And that's what 8Sleep allows you to do. It allows you to program the temperature of your mattress and sleeping environment such that you fall and stay deeply asleep easily and wake up each morning feeling incredibly refreshed and energized. I've been sleeping on an 8Sleep mattress cover for almost three years now, and it has dramatically improved the quality of my sleep. If you'd like to try 8Sleep, you can go to 8Sleep.com slash Huberman to get $150 off their Pod 3 mattress cover. 8Sleep currently ships in the USA, Canada, UK, select countries in the EU, and Australia. Again, that's 8Sleep.com slash Huberman. And now for my discussion with David Goggins. David Goggins, welcome. My man. Good to see you again, man. Great to see you. It was late 2016, early 2017, I believe, when you were in my lab at Stanford. Yes, sir. Uh, we did a little work later that that day uh, yep. down in San Jose. And gosh, uh, see you everywhere, but it's not enough. So great to have you here. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, bro. Yeah. You embody discipline and doing hard things. Right. I think you just start right off with yep. the, the, the Let's bold, just go there. The bold truth. <laughs> But right before we went hot mics, right, we were talking about learning. Right. Right now, you're spending some time learning and doing things that I think most people probably don't typically associate David Goggins with. Right. So why don't you tell us about that? Well, most people just look at me as the guy that runs and yells as he's running. And that's uh, while I do that, you know, to motivate people. But people don't understand that my day is broken up into segments. I work out. I eat, I sleep, but I spend most of my time studying. So, like, I'm in the medical world. I'm a, you know, paramedic in, uh, in Canada. But I spend a lot of my time trying to nuke every single thing about it because I'm not trying to just be a paramedic, learn about veins and arteries and how the heart pumps and stuff like that. I'm trying to learn to the point where I can save someone's life. And even though paramedics are doing that all over the world, I'm trying to be that paramedic that can really dissect exactly what's going on and figure out, you know, what medication goes where. Just trying to, you know, just trying to learn, you know, the, uh, the algorithm of what's going on, man. So I spend a lot of time with it. I love the word algorithm because when I teach biology or try and learn anything mm -hmm. that's related to biology, especially the human body, right. I need to know the nouns. Yep. 
but it's the verbs that matter. And that's really what you're talking about. Like, like just saying that, that sits there, that brain part there doesn't right. tell you how it all works together. No. So what is your process for studying look like? Like if we dropped a, uh, a, uh, camera in the room, but right. a microphone into that, into your inner dialogue, right? Gosh, wouldn't, wouldn't we all love that? But if we dropped a microphone into your inner dialogue, are you waking up looking at the books and going, yeah, fresh day, right. let's learn? Or is some of the same resistance that you've talked about coming up around physical yep. work, is that coming up from time to time? You know what? I was nervous at first. I'm going to keep the mother... I'm, I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it real. So I'm not a real smart guy. And what I mean by that is I was born with ADD, ADHD, all, like... My brain cannot retain information. I'm not some genetic freak when it comes to running, when it comes to lifting weights. I'm, I am absolutely the bottom of the barrel. And people will never believe me. And they can just, you know, whatever. Believe what you want to believe. So when you ask me this question about what does studying look like for me, I have to go over the same page over and over and over and over again. While Jennifer can look at that page, while she's you know, quizzing me, she'll learn it right then as she's, she doesn't know anything about it. She will quiz herself or quiz me and learn it as she's quizzing me. It's the most frustrating thing in the world how my brain works. So what I, so what I do is I literally sit there with a pen and paper and I have my books and I go through and have to write everything down every single day. I will study the same page until it's photographic memory from writing the same thing down. And then from there, I'll go back through and relearn it again. So I'll learn the bulk of it, but then I'll go through and learn the small things within that. So if it's a medication, I'll learn what the medication does. I'll first, I'll learn how to even say the medication because these medications aren't like, you know, like albuterol. No, it's, it's, it's very big words. So I'll go through, learn how to say the name. Then I'll go through, learn what the dose is. Then I'll go through, and this is like every single day. It's not like, oh, I got it. Let's just go through. No, nothing is I got it. Every single thing. That's, so I, I, I can't wait to get in this conversation because everything I do in life, it sucks. Everything I do in life, it sucks. That's why when I was 300 pounds and 24 years old, it wasn't like I had some big epiphany of, Let's just go be a Navy SEAL and let's lose some weight. No, I knew my entire life was going to be a struggle, which is why I just ignored it. And I said, I'm not even trying to jump off into this shit and learn how to read, how to write, how to memorize, how to become something I am not. But through that process, something happened to me. And I realized that's, this is why I feel sorry for no one. In this podcast, they're going to really not like me because people are going to think that I am maybe lying or maybe fibbing or exaggerating. No, I am literally, I was the lowest form on earth, no talent, no ability to learn. And I literally know what it is to be rock bottom and to build that up. So that question about learning, it's a pain in my ass and I don't have to do it. So think about it. I'm 49 years old and I'm a multimillionaire. I don't have to do anything. So all I thought about when I was growing up is, man, I can't wait to one day get to the point where I no longer have to do this stuff. But what happens, I got older, it became a way of living. So how I do every day is how I do every day. It's a, it's a discipline. It's a regimen. It's a, it's a, it was a choice I made. And the choice I made was, what are you willing to sacrifice and what are you willing to give up to find every bit of who you are as a human being? And I was willing to give everything to do that. So studying is no joke. I love that you're studying. I recall a few years ago, I heard uh, a, some interview or podcast with you and you just threw out like, I don't know what I'll do next. Maybe I'll be a scientist. Yeah. And, I, and I went, yeah. yeah. I was like, because I knew because I know you a bit right. and I see your work out there, but we'd met before that if you decided that you were going to do it right. and learning medicine, which is what you're doing, right. learning human physiology is so detailed and, and people 
uh, out there have to understand when you look at a textbook and you see the the veins and the capillaries different colors mm -hmm. in the when the body's open they're not different colors right, right? you know right, they're not right. so i mean some things are have different color contrasts but it's not like it's all labeled when you pop it open exactly and so so the process of writing things down by hand is mm -hmm. important for you do you go, so you go back and read those notes do you think about that stuff on your runs too or are you segmenting your day like when you're done studying are you heading out for a run and thinking about other things or are you still rehearsing the material in your head so when i write it down I write it down and I'm able to, I'm actually looking down at this table right now because I'm back to write. And so I'm actually there right now as I'm speaking to you. I write it down in a way that I'm memorizing page 69. So I'm writing it down. So then writing it down and that page sync together in my brain. So I'm looking at the book in my brain right now. So like, that's just how it works for me. And I have to do it over and over again. So that page, it's stuck in my mind. So I'm literally flipping through pages as I'm taking these tests and I'm taking these national tests to become a paramedic or become a advanced EMT or whatever. I'm literally, as I'm taking that test, I'm going through and I'm like, now I'm flipping pages in my head to where that page was. And how I do that is just from how I, how I write it and how it's on the page. When I run, I can't recall any of it. Hmm. I cannot I cannot bring any of that because I'm running. How my mind is wired now is that everything I do is what I do because the focus it takes for me to, like right now, I'm running. I'm not like a great runner. I'm not like injury free. So like my first 20 minutes of the run, I'm limping. I'm literally limping because I've had several knee surgeries and my body was twisted. And so now it's untwisting. So people look at me, oh, it looks like he's limp, you know, like limping when he runs. I am limping when I run. My body's jacked up. So I'm focusing on how to get the best out of a broken body. So everything I do is a total focus on what I'm doing at that, at that point in my life. So it seems like you've really trained away or somehow gotten away from the ADD that mm -hmm. you mentioned. Because what you described is like a deep trench. Mm -hmm. It's like a V-shaped trench. I'm right. imagining like there's a ball bearing and it's like, Phew! and it can only go forward in that trench. Right. Or back and it goes forward. It, it's not like sliding around at the like concave at the bottom. Right. At like a tension. So it's like you've trained that up. Is there a similar feeling when you're in the full focus of running versus full focus of studying? Is it kind of feel like, oh yeah, that's the same groove, but different thing? Or is it just completely different world? It's a completely different world. Like, it's just, both of them for me, it's, it's suffering, but it's suffering a whole different way. Like when I was going through school, I'll never forget, I think I was in third grade. And back then, you know, ADD, ADHD, wasn't like, you know, here's this medicine, or here's this thing. They want to put you in a special school. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was so far behind in learning that their big thing was, Let's just put him in a special school because he'll never learn. And through that process of like, I don't want to be in a special school. I don't want to be treated any differently. It really, like, I never took medication. I've never taken medication for this. That's why right now you see me looking right in your eyes. What the hell is, is you know, is you've been saying right now? And that's why I don't feel bad for people who have ADHD, who have learning disabilities. And some are impossible because you just can't. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them you can. And but people don't want to go through the process of focus, of teaching yourself how to truly focus. This is where my message gets lost. It gets lost because I may say, you know, MF or F, where, you know, I may be because that's the passion that comes out of me, because that's it takes everything for me to learn a sentence. So when I speak about David Goggins, I can't speak about David Goggins in a way that's just calm and cool. Because when I wake up, I know the journey that it takes for me to find my greatness. And it's hard. Every, nothing is easy. Nothing just like, oh, I wake up and I just do this or I do that. Or it just, you know, I watch people every day go through life and it's so easy. For me to be where I'm at today, it takes every bit of me. So when I speak about it, and as I get going here, you'll start seeing me, the temple will rise. The passion will come out because I'm back there. I'm doing what I do every day to become a human being. 
And so nothing is easy. Like running is running. It sucks. But you have a choice to make. Do you want to sit down and go back to that guy you once were? No. So this is what it takes. This, it, it takes that misunderstanding of people, and they'll never get it because they were never David Goggins. So that is what it takes for me to do what I do. It may take you something differently. So for me, everything has to be in the study. Everything has to be in this. Everything has to be in everywhere I am. It has to be there. Me, focus where I am. That's why you're my second podcast I've done since Rogan, since the book came out. I don't have time for that shit. Because if I want to be great, I'm not trying to maximize money or maximize people knowing me. I do these things because maybe someone out there will understand me and get it and say, I can grow from this guy. And others just won't. Sounds like friction is something you're very familiar with. I just, this yes. word just as I feel like it's like yes. cast above us right now in yes. bold face, highlighted, underlined letters. It's just friction like is growth. friction. Yes. Like you're, you're up in the morning and I imagine David Goggins going to the coffee maker, yep. stretching out, good morning, sunshine. And you're telling me from eyelids open, mm -hmm. there's friction. Yes. And that is the thing that people don't, they don't fucking get. The biggest misunderstanding about David Goggins of all time it's like, whether you believe in God or not, I do. He put this lab rat, which is me, on this planet and said, let me fucking see what a beat up, abused kid who has, who can barely learn, barely learn, who has a twisted body, messed up, messed up genetics, sickle cell, this and that. Let me give him everything that pretty much disqualifies you from the military. But back then, it wasn't estrus. And, and let's put him in this and see what comes out of it. So to do that, friction. You don't wake up in the morning time and go to the coffee maker. Matter of fact, sometimes you don't even sleep. What it requires is when I'm at 2 o'clock in the it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And my brain is thinking about a fucking drug. And I got to get up and look in my book to see if that drug is, the, how I remember it. And this is every day of my fucking life. That's why when I train a fighter or I train someone, I'm like, you have no fucking idea how great you really are because you are using such minimal, minimal of what you have. And if people can learn to focus, this is what's possible. While it may not be pretty, like people want to do a documentary on me. I go, no, I don't want you to do a documentary on me. Because I will have normal, everyday people picking me apart. Oh, his life is miserable. Who wants to live like that? He looks, it's crazy how he's, it's almost like he's sick, he's psychotic. The most frustrating thing in the world for me is when normal people judge a man like myself on what it really takes to extract greatness from nothing. It takes every bit of who you are if you choose that route. If you don't, Merry Christmas. Do what you got to do. But, yeah, all these things for me, like, like I told you, man, I'm, I'm going to keep it real. I didn't, I'm not coming here to talk about, like, you know, perform without purpose. Because I go through, when I write these books, I go through and try to dumb down David Goggins. How can I give normal people, and I'm normal, but I found something that most don't want to find. How can I speak to people and give them something from this crazy, psychotic brain that I've developed? How can I give them that? So I sit down with Jennifer for years and write down, perform without purpose, callous your mind, armor your mind, the cookie jar, the accountability mirror, shit that people can fucking use in their lives. No, no. I'm glad it helps you, but the barbaric life that I live, that you have to live, the almost obsession that you must have to be great, you can't put that shit in a fucking book, bro. You can't put it in a book. You can't. You can't write about it. It has to be experienced. It has to be experienced. And you can't even, after you experience it, to write it in a book, it would seem like it needs to be locked up. This too, go too gory. It's, it's too gory. It doesn't make sense for a guy that everything, every second of the day, he is trying to extract more from something. He's constantly thinking. He's constantly, constantly disciplined, never going off the path. 
Whatever is injured on him, he figures a way. It's a conqueror's mindset. And very few people, if any, can really understand what that is. Like, a, a, I'm almost 50, and I've been this way for almost 30 years. Like, what do you do for fun? You, you never, like, I, I, these questions, I don't, I don't get them. I don't understand them. I don't, so, yeah. I get asked that sometimes. What do you for fun? I start listing off all the stuff like podcasting, reading, right. Right, working out. Right. You know? But so some of that resonates. But I think what's so truly unusual about what you're describing, your process, mm -hmm. is that, you know, from go, it's hard. Yep. And I have to ask, was being 300 pounds, having a cent – I'm using the words you've described. No, do you, it. You've said it before. Mm -hmm. You had a tendency at one point in your life – early on, tell lies, yep. try and get people's approval. Lie my ass off. Crazy haircuts, mm -hmm. attention seeking, and and yet all of that triggered something mm -hmm. that now is, you know, is extraordinary. Right. Do you think those hardships were necessary to flip the switch? I don't know if they were necessary, but it was something that made me feel I didn't feel good. It was easy. The brain that I was given as a child, it was easy to go home and think about what, how do I want to be a freak today? How do I want to show up to school today and be a freak? It didn't require me going home and opening a book up saying, it's going to take me all year to learn this fucking page. So instead of learning that page, I learned how to become a character. And Maybe that character that I created, that 300-pound insecure guy that used to fake, fake it till I make it type of guy, you know, let me uh, become your friend, let me lie to you until you like me type of guy. When, when you have any kind of, any manhood, womanhood, a human being, a soul, a spirit, any, I had no, I, had, I must have just this much pride because that's exactly what opened the door for me. Because every day you were a character, every day you were a clown, every day you opened that Spanish book or that science book or English book, and you like you looked at it, it was like it looked like a foreign language. And you're saying, where do I start? Where, where do I start? And obviously it was necessary. The more I talk about it, it was necessary. Because what happened is I became haunted by the mere fact that this is my existence. And you got to live with that. And I lived with it for a lot of years. And so I sat back and said, okay, all right, I know what this takes. And when you sit back as fucked up as I was, and I had a laundry list, a, a, a table like this of what I have to do to become just a human being that can make ends meet, that can make $1,000 a month just to get there. It was like, oh, my God, dude, like how did – I'm 16, 17, I can't read, I can't write. And I, oh my God, I'm so behind the power curve and my brain is about being depressed and my dad beat, my mom's not home and kids are calling me nigger at school and I'm like, oh my God, man, what the fuck do I do? And it wasn't like someone came around and said, hey man, you can do this. This is all me. Some people know, where does this cold man come from? I'm not trying to be cold. It's the reality of my life. It's the reality of a lot of people's lives. And so, yeah, it, it, that had to happen for me to be haunted, to be haunted, to pull out, to extract the guy at the end of the day. That haunting is something that's still there today because no matter how much you improve, no matter how much you change who you are, it's not permanent. You don't just wake up and say, oh my God, man, you're, you're David Goggins. You break records. You do this. You do that. People want to know, how are you, how are you able to just be so hard? Because I never turned the fucking thing off. Because once it turns off, I go right back to the David Goggins that is. And that's the guy that I'm constantly fighting every day. And it's a choice. And that choice makes you misunderstood. It makes you crazy. That's why I hate fucking social media. In 2013, people wanted me to write my book. I did it in 2018. It took five years. 
And the reason why I didn't do it, I sat at the table and Jennifer was there. This is before I, 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 she started working for me. I started dating or whatever. And all these people were there. And they're like, man, you got to go on social media. And I was like, fuck you, man. Like, I'm not, that's, it's, it's poison. It's poison because I knew what I did to get where I am. And I'm going to have these people, these normal, everyday people, fat, lazy, is exactly who I was, judging me. Because I know it. Because I was once them. All my hard work, all my dedication, I'm going to have some normal dude get his little brownies, little ding-dong, ho-ho, Twinkie, sit there with his coffee, picking me apart. At, oh, he must be unhappy. He's just, do you know how hard it is to put these shoes on every damn morning and I'm going to have you pick me apart? So, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's so much that goes into this that I was like, fuck this. I never want anything to do with it. So, anyway. I'm not a psychologist, mm -hmm. but knowing your story from what you've written, what you've said on social media and elsewhere podcasts, and right. here now especially, right. it's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it pulls at my heartstrings a little bit. I realize that's not what you're trying to do, but that in the course of your childhood and in your young adulthood, mm -hmm. that no one ever got between you and the world. No. I forget where I heard it, that like if a kid has just one person that believes in them. Right. You know, and I had my trials and tribulations, but I had great coaches, great mentors. Right. I attached to them. I found them if they didn't necessarily find me. Right. But I'm realizing that your situation was no one's ever said, hey, I'm going to stand here next to you or get in front of you, right. put a shield up. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like you've got these different ver it's all you, but there's versions of yourself that like you knew social media, like I don't know that I have the wherewithal in 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17 right. to get in front of myself while doing all this because I've already got so much going on in here. Right. Is that about right? That is right, but I had developed a lot of anger and I still have it. And it will never go away for the normal human beings of this world. Because when you put yourself in the sewer like I was in, and please, if someone saved me, come out and announce it to the world. There was no one. There's no one. So when you know that, and then I'm sitting at the table with all these smart people who are telling me what to do and shit and guiding me through my life now, when I'm 40 fucking years old, you know, two, I, was, I don't know, 40 something years old, now I'm 49. And I'm looking at them all, and they're, and they're now trying to guide me on what's right, on this poison. And so, yeah, what you say is right, but for me, it was more of, I know now. I don't need you to guide my future. I know what's good for me and what's bad for me. And for me, it took every bit of focus I could. And I know social media, that's why people love to go on there. Because they want to show you the good side of life. I'm not teaching good side of life. So I had to figure out a way when I came on in 2016 of teaching you what life really is for the majority of us is hell. And so while people love to show you the cars and the house and the vacations and shit, all that's good. All that's happy. I'm going to show you the side that I know most of you are going through. And people hide very well. I don't want to hide anymore. I hid for 24 fucking years. So that's why now I told you, we can talk about any, whatever you want. Because as human beings, the one we, the, the, the first thing we have to learn, I also stuttered real bad growing up. So if you hear me stutter every now and then, it's because that was part of my life also. So it's funny, human beings want to show you the best side. And they want to hide the worst side. For me, I'm going to teach you how to be vulnerable. Because that's the only way you fix yourself. You don't fix yourself by coming out here and me selling you some fucking books. That's why I don't have them. I forgot them. I'm glad people got something from the book. I want you to learn that the only way you grow is how to look at yourself and say, okay, like I did. Table longer than this. What the fuck I have to do to get somewhere? There was nothing good on there. Nothing. Yeah, I love playing basketball. I left that out. That's something I love to do. 
I don't care about that. That, that didn't make the fucking list. Because the list that I had to live by was, it, was the very list that was to get me at this table with you. To talk to you, to the normal human beings was I once was, about how you can get somewhere and how it looks. It looks very ugly. There's no fucking passion. There's no fucking motivation. There's no, oh my God, man, I fucking, this is, no. It's every day of your life just doing. No passion, no discipline, no motivation. Yeah, all these words, I hate people. I hate that so many people fucking use these words now because it, it, it's watered. It's someone sitting in a room by themselves and they figure themselves out and say, God, this is going to fucking suck. Where's passion when you're 300 pounds? Where's the motivation when you can't read and write? Where is it? So how did this happen? I just fucking did. I just did. I said, maybe at the end of this journey, there'll be something there for me. If not, I can read. If not, I'm 185 fucking pounds. There's no, there's, 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 there's no magic potion. There's no, oh, let me wake up and look at some shit. No, all those words are overused. They're bullshit. It's all bullshit. Just do. You're living. How do you want to live? How do you want to die? How do you want to fucking be remembered? That's, that's it. That's it. Period. As many of you know, I've been taking AG1 daily since 2012. So I'm delighted that they're sponsoring the podcast. AG1 is a vitamin mineral probiotic drink that's designed to meet all of your foundational nutrition needs. Now, of course, I try to get enough servings of vitamins and minerals through whole food sources that include vegetables and fruits every day, but oftentimes I simply can't get enough servings. But with AG1, I'm sure to get enough vitamins and minerals and the probiotics that I need, and it also contains adaptogens to help buffer stress. Simply put, I always feel better when I take AG1. I have more focus and energy, and I sleep better, and it also happens to taste great. For all these reasons, whenever I'm asked, if you could take just one supplement, what would it be? I answer AG1. If you'd like to try AG1, go to drinkag1.com slash Huberman to claim a special offer. They'll give you five free travel packs plus a year supply of vitamin D3 K2. Again, that's drinkag1.com slash Huberman. The word haunted mm -hmm. is ringing in my head. Yep. I think it's such a powerful word. Yep. Because I was about to say, it seems like a huge part of your process, maybe the entire process, is it's all stick, no carrot. You know, you talk about the yep. carrot, the positive thing, and then there's the stick, the thing you're trying to avoid. Yep. I feel like it's – the way it's landing for me mm -hmm. is it's all stick and gas pedal. That's it. There's no carrot. You're not imagining, oh, when I'm a paramedic, when yep. the book is published – and obviously you set those goals and you make those targets. Yep. But it's all stick. All stick. No carrot. Think about that. I'm waking up right now studying, like I have a test tomorrow. I already passed the fucking test. Think about that. Every day of my life, that's what I must do just to retain what I learned. Four hours plus a day, I go through and do that. There's no stick. Or there's only a stick. There's never been a carrot. Which is why when I speak to people, I have to figure out a way to resonate with them. Because all I want to say to them is, <laughs> let me teach you the real life, how it really is. The reason why you're a loser and the reason why you're not fucking making it and the reason why you're trying to go to all these, I go to all these fucking conventions, speak all the fucking time. I look in the fucking audience and these people sign up, sign up, sign up fucking every year to go to a convention thinking they're going to learn something fucking different. No, you're lazy. You know exactly what to do, exactly what to do. Because even me, in my state of, I can't read and write, I knew exactly what to do. It just sucks doing it. It sucks to do it. It sucks to wake up every morning of your life and say, God, man, I'm... I'm not smart, so guess what I got to do? I got I to gotta study the same shit that I got one of the highest scores in the nation on and do it again, do it again, do it again. It's not just there. It's not just there for, permanently for me. So, yeah, it's all stick. It's all stick. 
the only carrot you have is like, maybe, maybe, because whenever I take these tests that are real hard, in the back of my brain, it's like, the good chance you're not going to make it, Goggins. This ain't you, bro. This ain't you. You weren't born like this. This ain't you. The real you, bro. Study all you want to, but the second that fucking computer comes on with 150 questions, this ain't you, man. And somehow, it comes back, I passed. I passed again. I passed again. But that real me back here every fucking time is saying, that ain't you, bro. That ain't you. And I have to outwork that voice. When I'm taking that test and I get to a question, I don't fucking know the answer. I'm like, fuck, man. And then, say, I told you, man, that ain't you. You're 300 pounds, man. You sit at home, you figure out how to do your hair. That's what you do, how to come to school with the reverse baldness when you're 16. That's, what, that, that's, that's you. So there is no get out of jail free card. This is why I say stay hard. Because when you weren't given the gifts, the only thing you can do in life is stay hard. And I know people cannot stand me. They can't stand this talk. This is all you can do. There's no magic pill or a magic potion. All you can do is outwork the man that God created or woman in you. And what that looks like is unfun. That's why I said, do not do a documentary on me. Because people will not see the truth. They will see what they want to see. Is, I don't want to live like that. Good. Good. And you will live exactly the way you live now. Questioning who you are. Wondering what is possible. Wondering what you are capable of doing. That's how that looks. Or you can be me, which, am I happy? I don't know. Never really thought about it. Don't really care about it. Because all I really cared about was when I looked in that fucking mirror, I saw a piece of shit. Happiness wasn't on the mirror at 16. Or when I was 300 pounds. It wasn't like, oh my, I'm looking for happiness. No, I'm looking to look at myself in the mirror and say, all right, motherfucker, you did it again today. You're a bad boy. Because that shit sucks. I have about a couple minutes of that when I got the carrot. The second I lay down and go to bed, the carrot's gone because I'm waking up all through the night to check the work I did that day. Did I get this drug right? Did I get this right? Did I get that right? What did I do? Oh my God, fuck. I'm, I'm, I'm already losing it. It's a stick. That stick is haunting you. Haunting It's, it's following you around. Mm -hmm. So no picture of Jordan on the wall. You're not listening to YouTube inspiration video. No. Those would be all your voice anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not uh, listening to your top 10 favorite songs just to get rolling and then lace the shoes, hit the books. You're, it's all in here. All in there. I used to do that when I was fat. Rocky, I mean, people know that, that was my thing. Uh, round 14 was my thing. And as I got older and older and older, that started to go away. And I started to create, I had all these people that I used to watch. Rocky was one, Barnes, Elias from Platoon, um, Jack from A Few Good Men. You know, he's on the stand going crazy. I saw a lot of these characters that I looked at and I was like, man, I ain't got none of that. But they were characters. After a while, I lived a life so disciplined that everybody that I once looked to, these fake characters, I, I, I built that as a man. And when I was younger, I had this image in my mind of what does a man look like to me? And I got all these people who were badasses, characters. And in my mind, I became that. And that's what kept me going a lot was I had this pipe dream of becoming a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Because when you have no parents raising you and you have no role models growing up, you, it's not daydreaming. You start to create a reality that, hmm, maybe I can be that. And after becoming this guy, that is the biggest thing I can ever do in my life is I became that guy. 
that I once looked at all these guys, now look at myself like, God, who the fuck can do that? I can. But what it takes is a, a discipline that no one can ever even, they, they just don't, they don't understand it. They don't understand, but everybody has the ability to do it, but they just don't want to. They want to keep asking questions and keep going to seminars. And the greatness is right in you. And that's why, once again, I'll say this a million times here, I do not feel sorry for you. I will not sugarcoat what I'm going to say to you because all of you know what I'm saying is the truth. Everybody knows it's the truth. This is what it looks like. And you know it too. You know what, too? This is what, if, if you ain't got nothing, I hate to tell you, what it looks like is ugly. It's not a documentary. It's not an HBO special. You ain't gonna watch them, but hey, man, you guys gotta watch this. No, it's like, oh, God, this looks like a train wreck. It's like a nightmare. This looks like this guy got, no. That's what it looks like. Hard work looks horrible. It's not motivating. It's not motivating at all. It ain't like Rocky round 14. He gets knocked down and goes like this to Apollo Creed. It looks like a man being stuck in a fucking dungeon. And there's no fucking way out. But you had the fucking key. But you refuse to use it. And that's nothing motivating about that. So, yes, no documentary on David Goggins. The real life. The real David life. David Goggins is the, is the documentary. It's, all, it's already being written. You're it. Right. Yeah. I'm going to share a little neuroscience tidbit. Love it. But I think it's one that you'll appreciate. Um, most people don't know this. But there's a brain structure called the anterior mid-cingulate cortex. As we pointed out before, that's a noun. It's a name. It doesn't mean anything. Right. We could call it the, the cookie monster. Right. But what's interesting about this brain area is there are now a lot of data mm -hmm. in humans, not some mouse study, showing that when people do something they don't want to do, mm -hmm. like add three hours of exercise per day or per week, or when people who are trying to diet and lose weight resist eating something. Right. When people do anything that they, and this is the important part, that they don't want to do. Right. It's not about adding more work. It's about adding more work that you don't want to do. Yes. This brain area gets bigger. Yep. Now, here's what's especially interesting about this brain area to me. And by the way, I'm only learning this recently mm -hmm. because it's new data, but there's a lot of it. The anterior mid cingulate cortex is smaller in obese people. Mm -hmm. It gets bigger when they diet. Mm -hmm. It's larger in athletes. Mm -hmm. It's especially large or grows larger in people that see themselves as challenged and overcome some challenge. Right. And in people that live a very long time, mm -hmm. this area re keeps its size. Mm -hmm. In many ways, scientists are starting to think of the anterior mid cingulate cortex not just as one of the seats of willpower, right. but perhaps actually the seat of the will to live. See, now we're talking. And when I learned about the anterior mid cingulate cortex, I was like almost out of my seat. And I've been in the neuroscience game since I was 20. Now we're the we're same talking. age. And I was so pumped because I've heard of the amygdala, fear, prefrontal cortex, it's planning and action. I could tell you every brain area and every, I teach neuroanatomy to medical students. But when I started seeing the data on the anterior mid cingulate cortex, I was like, whoa, this is interesting. Yep. And all the data point to the fact that we can build this area up, yep. but that as quickly as we build it up, if we don't continue to invest in things that are hard for us, that we don't want to do, that's the part that feels so Goggin-esque yes, to me that we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Like if you love the ice bath, yeah, I love the ice bath. And you go from one minute to 10 minutes, mm -hmm. guess what? Your anterior mid cingulate cortex did not grow. None. But if you hate the cold water, mm -hmm. if you're afraid of drowning mm -hmm. and you get into water and put your head under, yep. then your anterior mid and survive, then the anterior mid cingulate cortex gets bigger. But if you don't do it the next day, or if you do it the next day and you enjoy it, because mm -hmm. hey, hey, I did it yesterday. Woohoo. Mm -hmm. Happy me. Merry Christmas, as That's you right. would say. Merry Christmas. Guess what? The anterior mid cingulate cortex shrinks again. Yep. To me, this is one of the most important discoveries that neuroscience has ever made mm -hmm. because it's that I don't want to do something but do it anyway That's right. that grows this area. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like I have a friend. He's been sober 30 years from alcohol. Mm -hmm. And he always says, you know, the amazing thing about addiction is there's a cure. The problem is it only works one day at a time. Yep. And so you have to renew it every day. That's right. 
So the anterior mid cingulate cortex to me, when I learned about it, two, two things went off in my head. Whoa, this is super interesting. And two, I got to tell David Goggins about this. And I waited until I'm now glad. to tell you because I felt like, I, well, for obvious reasons, I wanted to tell you and I wanted to tell you here. Well, I love that because that's how I've lived my entire life. I don't know anything about that. But people go, man, you have such a strong will. It's something that you build. Like, I never forget, I was on a podcast one time, and this dude goes, you were blessed with a strong mind. Like, what the hell are you talking about? I was blessed with a strong mind. You, that's something that you have to develop. You develop that over years, decades of suffering and going back into the suffer. That's why a lot of people who graduate Navy SEAL training, they were no... Like, in my, I talk about it very openly all the time. A lot of guys don't go, don't, don't want to go back into that water. Don't want to go back into the hard stuff. Maybe not anything, anything hard, anything hard in life. Once you get through it, it's like you become a POW. Like, how many POWs you know want to go back to POW camp? None. When something sucks so bad in life, this is on this that we're talking about now. Very few people want to go back. They're happy they graduated. I realized I'm the same way. I don't want to go back. I have to go back. I must go back. Because that is exactly where all the knowledge of my life exists, was back there in what you're exactly what you're talking about. Well, I, I didn't know anything about this, but how I grew a will was constantly doing these things to now, it's just life. I wake up while it still sucks, it's just life. You don't sit back and like, oh my God, like I have days I don't wanna do it, but I know I'm gonna do it. I know from years of just doing it. So I, that, that's, that's beautiful. And this is why I came on here with you today. And I'm, I'm glad that you're talking about this because human beings need to hear this. They need to stop hearing these hacks on this and that. There's no fucking hack, bro. There's no fucking hack. Yeah, you may this and that and saunas and, this and all this shit that they, yeah, it's great. There is no fucking life hack. To grow that thing, how do you grow it? Do it and do it and do it and do it. That's the hack. The hack is gonna fucking suck. And that's what I realized. That's what I realized. Life. That's why I wanted to come on here today. I didn't want to come on here and talk about no fucking passion and purpose and how to get the fuck out of bed and how to hit a fucking alarm clock and all this catchphrase bullshit because that wasn't how I lived. That wasn't how I lived. I lived, I woke up like every human being does and goes, fuck, man, I'm a fucking piece of shit today. How the hell is this going to work out for me? And you fight that. And you fight that. You don't override it. There's no override button. It's the conversation in your fucking, like, in your head. So how do you do that? We don't have enough of these conversations about the real conversation that every human being is having. And they have no idea how to get out of it, but they do. It's that shit right there, man. You gotta build your will. How do you build your will? Exactly what you said, man. Exactly what you said. Well, I feel like, knowing the name of something, anterior mid cingulate cortex, doesn't fundamentally change us. But one thing I like about biology mm -hmm. is that willpower, if somebody feels they don't have it, right. feels like this thing that other people have. But everybody, unless they're brain damaged, like a hole right. through their head, has two anterior mid cingulate cortex, one on each side of their brain. Everyone has one. Mm -hmm. They have two. So I feel like it's just a question of opening the portal. And the portal, what I, again, I'm going to say 10 times and forgive me, is I think people go, oh, I do hard things. I do sets to failure and then I do four reps. I love training with weights. Mm -hmm. I love doing sets to failure. I even like four reps. But guess what? I like four reps. So I could, I'll tell you, they don't build my anterior mid cingulate cortex. Right. Because I like to do it. That's right. Anything you like to do is not going to enhance this aspect of willpower. Mm -hmm. And it seems so obvious once you hear it, you kind of go, Oh, yeah, of course. But I think you really close that loop for people mm -hmm. when you share what you're sharing today. 
and what you've shared elsewhere before as well, when you're trying to explain the friction is the critical ingredient. Right. And I think people think, oh, if it's effort, well, then I'm getting better. That's part of it, necessary but not sufficient, as right. we say in science. But the suck part, mm -hmm. the haunt, being haunted, mm -hmm. the stick, mm -hmm. they're really unpleasant terms. Very. These are probably the most unpleasant terms we've ever used on this podcast. Very. Those are the, those are the levers. Those mm -hmm. are the gears. And without those, this thing that you're talking about, David Goggins, mm -hmm. as a verb. Right. You know, I, I sometimes make the joke, but it's not a joke. Right. Goggins is a name mm -hmm. and it's a verb. People right. go, I'm going to Goggins that. Right. Right. But that's, I think, again, I'm not a psychologist, but I think that's what you're talking about. The stick, mm -hmm. the friction being haunted. It's the suck part that grows this anterior mid cingulate cortex. So now you know why there's so many people that fail in this world to figure out their purpose, their purpose in life. Where do I go? Because to grow that, while you may not look like me, how my daily life looks, it don't look fun. It don't look fun. So, it's a choice that people have to make in life. But what's so funny about it is even the richest of rich who have everything, they always ask me this question. I feel like I'm missing something. I don't feel like I'm missing shit. I don't have what you all have, but you'll never in my life hear me tell you I'm missing something. Everybody is. They're missing this feeling. I found it a long time ago. And I found it right there in that willpower thing. When you're nothing, nothing, and change yourself into something like me, you call it happiness, peace, whatever the fuck you want to call it, people are missing exactly what went on with David Goggins. Why don't you smile? I do. I do. But I figured something out. That's why I am never, you'll never hear me say I'm missing something. I found it years ago. You find it in the suck. You find it in the suck and you find it repeatedly in the suck to the point where you know exactly who you are. Most people are missing something because they don't know who they are. They never examine themselves. They, they've never done this experiment on themselves. The lab rat, we're all lab rats but you're also the scientist. You create your own self. Most people are missing something because there's so much trapped in there. I don't even wanna say potential. I think that's where you use out too much too. There's so much in you that God or wherever the hell you believe in, or if you're an atheist, in you, that you have not un unlocked, that you walk around with this gorgeous wife or, or great husband and all this money. And you're like, God, I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah, because it's, about 75% of you is still fucking in there. Still chained up because you just didn't want to find your willpower. Didn't want to find your soul, your will, your heart, your determination, your guts, your courage. And what that looks like, it looks scary. Like your little scary lab I went in. Scary. To wake up every day and say, I'm stupid, but I want to figure out a way to be smarter. Versus saying, man, I just can't do that. So you limit this box. So your box becomes so small of things you can do. My box wasn't even a box. It was a fucking little, like, little pinhole. And then through examining myself, getting some willpower, some courage, it became bigger than this table. But that's what we all do. That's why I wanted to come here today and talk to you about real shit. Not no fucking like hacks. There's no hacks, bro. It's you against you. You against you. And if you misunderstand that, you have a real problem, a real problem. I can understand you misunderstand me running down the street, shirt off, fuck this, no, nah, yeah, I can, I can get it, I get it. If you misunderstand what I'm saying right now today, the problem is you and you don't want to fix it. Well, the children of wealthy people are a case study in how not having enough friction can destroy a life. True statement. I mean... I could list off prominent names in the press, but those are actually the least interesting. What's probably more interesting as an example is all the ones we don't hear about 
because we never hear about them. Right. They just dwindle and wither. Or I think there's this big category of people I'm realizing as we have this conversation today that they're not super successful. They're not struggling. Mm -hmm. They're like successful enough that mm -hmm. they never have to, you can get to the point where you don't have to impose friction. You even said it. Right. Your bank account is in a place where you don't really need to do all the things you do, probably not even a small fraction of them. Do nothing. Right. But you realize the stick and being haunted is the uh, the fuel in the engine. Right. And you'd be a you'd be truly crazy to give that up. Because you've you've internalized all that. Right. But most people, they're they're good enough yep. for them. Yep. And so they don't actually want to be better badly enough mm -hmm. in order to start going rung after rung. You know? Well, think about when you build willpower and think about how much I've built. Now that you know about this, this I didn't know about this, but think about how much I've built. Everything I've ever done in my life, I didn't want to do. Everything, every day. I'm a lazy piece of shit. And I'm one of the hardest working people to ever step foot on this planet Earth. And I'm saying that very proudly because I know what I do. It's not cocky. I'll tell you I'm stupid, and I'll also tell you the exact opposite of what I've done. It's the truth. It is the truth. So imagine how much I've developed in that time frame. But this is the scary thing. Why most people don't want to do that, build that willpower, is because it is scary. It unlocks a whole bunch of things about who you are and who you're not. And a lot of people don't want to go down that journey to discover who they are and who they're not. Because it's, it's not a pretty journey. I mean, I've gone down it. It's not like I went down it once. I go down it all the time. And when you unlock that, and you, you can't just turn it off. Like people say, hey, well, how, how come you haven't retired yet? I built all this willpower. Do you think it's going to let me just retire because my, my, my knees hurt? It's telling me every morning, I wake up like, man, I don't, my knees hurt, my, my legs hurt, my body hurts, but you can still run. So why aren't you running? If you can still run, there'll be a time when you can't lace them up anymore, but you can still run. So I still run. When the time comes I can't run, the body will say, you just can't run. But if I can still do something, that willpower that I have created, it makes me do it every fucking day. And that's what they don't get. What builds a human being is you start with the small building blocks. And before you know it, man, you become something that you, it doesn't even make sense to most people because it's just who you are now. That's why I can still run at 50 with broke, with, at 49 with broke down knees and broke down body because my body knows you still can. Therefore I do. Second you stop, the, the willpower is gone. And that's beautiful. I'm so glad you brought that to me because I always wonder, what's this separation thing now? At 24 years old, I started building something that I didn't even know was going to be what it is now at 49. And that's all it was, was just that. This structure, anterior mid-cingulate cortex, has inputs and outputs from a bunch of places, but you'll probably not be surprised to learn that it's strongly activated when we move our body. Mm -hmm when we don't want to move our body. I feel like it, it's Jesus. like the David Goggins is, structure, man. right? It really you know, is. It is. And it also has strong connections to the dopamine reward pathway. Mm -hmm. And everyone goes, yay, dopamine reward. Everyone loves dopamine. Mm -hmm. I'm partially responsible for people knowing a bit more about dopamine. Mm -hmm. But dopamine's badly understood. Everyone thinks dopamine, dopamine hits. It's about reward. Mm -hmm. It's about motivation and drive. Mm -hmm. And there are pain inputs to the dopamine centers of the brain. No one talks about that. Everyone's like, oh, you want the chocolate, you know, chocolate, sex, cocaine, all that. Yeah, that's all true. Right. You release dopamine. Pain releases dopamine. The anterior mid cingulate cortex can trigger the release of dopamine in response to this thing that we're calling friction. And that's a learned thing. That's something that no animal or human being comes into the world learning. We all are averse to pain mm -hmm. and like pleasure, like sugar, fat, don't like hot surfaces. Right. But this is a structure that learns. Mm -hmm. It has neuroplasticity 
the ability to change throughout the entire lifespan. And here's the part that I think, again, this is just neuro nerd speak for what you already know and have done and exemplify is that it, people will say, oh, it has plasticity. You can change it. But guess what? It has plasticity in both directions. It can grow, but just as easily as it can grow, it's like silly putty, it can shrink. Right. So it requires constant upkeep. Right. And that answer isn't one that people are going to like. Nope. They're like, give me the energy drink. Give me the supplement. Give me the, yes. give me the sauna protocol that's yes. going to make my anterior mid cingulate yes. cortex. But someone out there right now is going, wait, if I took transcranial magnetic stimulation and I stimulate, yeah, you'd probably, actually, they've done that. They stuck a little wire during neurosurgery into this structure. This is actually discovered by a, a colleague of mine, Joe Parvizi. Stimulate and the patients go, I feel like there's a storm coming. And they go, oh, is it scary? And they go, no, I want to go through it. They come off the stimulation and people are like, this is the seat of what we're talking about. Right, exactly. And it learns. So the fact that you kept this brain structure, I'm convinced if we image your brain, it'd be large and it would be larger in two years, in a year. But this is the no days off rationale because it can grow and it can shrink. I know. What you're saying right now, I didn't know any of this. And I never, and I always talk to people, I, I wish I could just put this on paper. And, and you're saying it in a way that people can understand. I could never put into words on what I built and the power that is within all of us. But you put it so, like, in, in a scientific way. Most people, like, for me, he's just crazy. That's why I don't like talking about it, man. I know I'm not crazy. I know what I had to do to get where I had to go. People look at it as crazy because they're people that just, if you can't imagine yourself doing something, if you can't imagine yourself doing something, the person that's doing it is crazy. Because in your mind, the logic behind it, it doesn't compute. Therefore, you have to give somebody a title. And the title for me is usually, he's crazy, he's this, he's that. No, no. For some reason, me wanting to be somebody so fucking bad in my life. I created that. And I've been trying to figure out years of my life trying to explain to people. But even though you're explaining it now, this is the easy fucking part. Them listening to this shit is the easy fucking part. The part that why there will always be the ones of ones is because putting that practice Putting that into actual work? No, man. No. No. That's where the demons come in. That's where you're like, I, I, I don't want to be better. I don't want to be better. If this is what it takes to be better, I don't want to be better. So everybody's, that's why there's a lot of average. And it makes me so fucking mad. Every day I walk this earth and I see average all over the fucking place. And they want to ask me, how did you do it? I can't tell you how, because you're not going to fucking, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. You're going to continue, you, continue being out, because every day you wake up, like he says, it's not like, get the coffee, make the, make the pancakes, kiss the girl, kiss the kids. You wake up, right to work. Immediately, your mind is in action. No one wants to do that. No one. And I don't blame them. But don't be mad. When you're laying there in your fucking bed and you're in the fucking hospital and you're 70, 80, 90 years old and you're thinking, man, I feel like I didn't fucking do something. Because you did. You didn't do it. You didn't do shit. You may live a great life, man, but you're always going to feel empty inside. I don't feel empty. So call me what you want. There's not one empty bone in my fucking body because I have figured out that really the magic potion, at least to my life. And it's very rewarding. I'd like to take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is a personalized nutrition platform that analyzes data from your blood and DNA to help you better understand your body and help you reach your health goals. I've long been a believer in getting regular blood work done for the simple reason that many of the factors that impact your immediate and long-term health can only be analyzed from a quality blood test. 
A major problem with a lot of blood tests out there, however, is that you get information back about metabolic factors, lipids and hormones and so forth, but you don't know what to do with that information. With Inside Tracker, they make it very easy because they have a personalized platform that allows you to see the levels of all those things, metabolic factors, lipids, hormones, et cetera, but it gives you specific directives that you can follow that relate to nutrition, behavioral modification, supplements, et cetera, that can help you bring those numbers into the ranges that are optimal for you. If you'd like to try Inside Tracker, you can go to insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 20% off any of Inside Tracker's plans. Again, that's insidetracker.com slash Huberman. People like to talk about what they used to be able to do. I hear this a lot. You know, you should have seen me in high school. I always laugh. Yep. Like, yeah, okay, got it. Um, and it's not just guys. You should have seen me working out in high school. I was yeah. super fit. Um, people will look back to a time where they felt like they were capable of something and now they're not. Mm -hmm. And you kind of want to just grab them and go, wait, that was you then, it's you now. And But people tend to think about how the conditions that were around success must have been part of it. And you can understand why. It's like, it's very rational. I was in that situation, I was successful. I'm in this situation, I'm not. That was the past, this is the present, ergo, capable, right? right. You see how people get into these loops. And as you mentioned, you spent the first 20 years of your life in a extremely challenged circumstances. Yeah. And then you can see how people get to a point where like everything feels hard. Like when you're 300 pounds, I haven't never been 300 pounds, but I can't imagine it feels good to get up and move around. It's defeating. I got a friend, he's in excess of 300 pounds. We've been trying on him for years, but no, no win. And he's got crazy psoriasis on the back of his calves and he he actually smells bad sometimes because he he um can't wash as well as he would he's b big big right and uh it pulls on my sympathy right you know but life is very hard for him and getting worse he's a young guy with a lot of medical issues now for obvious reasons and so i think people like that think well it's already hard why would i make it harder your message is a little different and you have the life experience it's a lot different. You've been there. Mm -hmm. So for me, saying, oh, yeah, lose weight, you know, I was a skinny guy who got to be a less skinny guy. So I don't really have a foot to stand on. Right. What do you say to those people who are like, listen, I'm getting up in the morning is hard. Right. Trying to not dissolve into a puddle of my own tears and my own misery is hard. Do you know why people connect with my book so well? For some reason, God put me in almost every fucked up situation on the planet Earth. So when I talk to people, it's not sugar-coated because I'm not saying it from I'm, I was 175 pounds my whole life. I don't say much to those people. I, maybe you're a piece of shit. Maybe you're, you want to be nobody. Maybe you're happy exactly where you are in life because obviously you are. Maybe you don't have the determination to be somebody better than who you are. And if you want to live with that, I'll support you in that. If you're good with being who you are, that every day you wake up and every day you smell like shit because you can't wash your body well, and your skin's messed up because your health's so bad, and you can't put your clothes on right, you need help with that. You need help, like, when I was doing, I need help wiping my ass. That makes you feel good? There's nothing I can say to you. If every day you wake up with this, see, people are haunted but they obviously like horror films because they keep watching the same fucking movie. I don't like horror films. A lot of people like horror films. So I don't say much to them. I say exactly what I said to you right there because I was once you. I didn't like horror films, so I changed it. Some people are just, they become, like you said, it gets real small when you're lazy and you're fat. Your will, their will is so small that they don't have any, and you can't give it to them. There has to be something. This is, this is what I'm talking about now, because this isn't a hack. This has to be in you. Something in you has to wake up. And usually the only person that can wake it up is you. Sometimes you can read a David Goggins book because I was all this shit and then a lot more of fucked up. But if you don't have a little flame, you know, just that, just barely you're done. I can't, I can't light it for you. And that's 
the harsh reality of this life that I want to get across so fucking bad. You can watch me. You can watch you. You can watch fucking Rogan and Cameron Haynes, all these motherfuckers. You can go to Tony Robinson's fucking bullshit. Do all this shit. You do all this shit. If you, you could keep going back and keep spending money and spending money and spending money with no results. You can wonder, wow, maybe let me go try out David Goggins. He ain't going to fucking help you. You have to explore, examine the insides of yourself. And what do you really want out of life? Your friend and a lot of people out here just don't fucking want it. So guess what? Have fun with your life. Go from three to 350 to 400 to 450 to 500 because you don't want it. And that's the harsh reality. I can't give you shit. You can't give them shit. We can give you ideas. But in the, the day, when I was losing the weight, <clears throat> I had to miserably wake up every morning in the cold because it was Indiana, November when it started. I was miserable. This is your new life. Take it or leave it. There's no happiness about it. There's no peace behind it. It sucks. It just fucking sucks. And that's the one thing, if I could teach anybody anything, it just fucking sucks. And it's going to continue to suck. And then one day you'll get to a, a, a special part in your life that it might get a little bit better. But to lose the weight you have to lose, my friend, sorry, it's going to suck every fucking day. Because then when you're 300 pounds, you're going to go out to lose weight, you could probably get injured. So then you got to work on the injury and then you get even more depressed. This is what I went through. And then you're hungry because now you're depressed. It's, it's just a vicious cycle. And if you're not strong mentally and you have no willpower, you're going to continue falling back in this hole versus the man that sits back and goes, all right, motherfucker. This is why I cuss because this is what is in me. This is, this is what it took for me to be me. Sorry. It didn't take... Hey, okay, we're going to do this today. No, this fucking really sucks. This is real, dude. This is real. And every day, I'm, 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 I'm set back. I'm set back. I'm set back. I'm set back. So this is what I would tell your boy. This is exactly what I tell him. Every day you wake up, you're going to probably be set back for the first four weeks before you lose to significant weight because of the mind is going to be fucking with you the whole time. There's no dopamine. There's no dopamine in there at 300 pounds. You, you got nothing. Your hormones are shot. You have to envision something that is more powerful than you. Something has to get you out of bed. And you have to create it. It has to be false. Because you're not it. You're a fat piece of shit. And that's the reality of it. So you have to create a false reality to live in that just to get to work on yourself. That's the reality. He'll, he'll see this and he'll appreciate that message. We'll see what he does. We'll so, see. so far, last 13 years, it's been no movement. But I've had other friends who, uh, who were drug and alcohol addicts who quit after one conversation, never went back. That's awesome. That means they, they want it. Yeah, just a, a one, one guy, I won't out him, but walked up to me at a party in 2019, July fourth party and said, uh, I'm a pile. And I go, what? And he goes, I'm a pile. Look at me. I'm 60 pounds overweight. And I go, do you drink? He goes, every day. I go, how much? He goes, a case. He goes, I smoke a lot of weed. But he's successful in other areas of his life. And so I said, well, here's what I know. Quit alcohol and weed for you. You know, I'm not telling people what to do. Don't eat until 2 p.m. Get on an exercise bike and pedal in the morning like someone's chasing you with a poison dart till you want to puke. And I was kind of half joking. Right. And then uh, two months later, he was like, I haven't had a drink. I lost 30 pounds. He lost that 60 pounds. He never went back. Now he's, he's super fit. It's amazing. So some people flip the switch. He is very self-critical mm -hmm. by nature. That's what flips he's the switch. He's super self-critical. Yep. That's what flips the switch. Yeah. Think about it, man. We know what to do. We don't need Angie Huberman to tell us what to do. We know what to do. Every one of us. That's why he flipped it so fast. Because he knew what to do. He didn't go by your exact protocol. 
He didn't go by the exact, no, he knew exactly what to do. And you just saying some shit to him, it woke something up, he knew what to do. And that's the thing that people need to get that. You know what to do, why aren't you doing it? And I'm talking about myself now, you know, those modes of just kind of passive consumption, Mm -hmm. they're so easy to wash over us. I used to have this thing, and I'm fighting this now because mm-hmm. I knew we were going to have this conversation today, where I like to start things on the hour or the half hour. Right. Worst practice in the world for me because if I miss that half hour, I'm like, ah, it's 1233. I'll start at 1245. Right. Ah, it's 1245. I'll start at 1. I just lost time. Right. And then – and th- so this is so stupid. Right. And the other day I was like, man, I got to tell David about this because my new thing is I start no matter what time it is. Right. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I got a friend, he paints in the middle of the night. I'm like, you're an insomniac. He's like, I don't know. I just do it. Then sometimes he goes back to sleep. Sometimes he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got their thing. But I thought about this. I'm like, I'm no more. Am I going to say I'm starting at one? Because I I know me. If I miss the one o'clock ding and my pen's not hitting the paper, I'm not typing on the keyboard, I'm not going to do it. Right. Like that, that's a... Self-admitted weakness. I love it, man. Um, I had that for a lot of years. Um, I know I'm going to do it. That's the haunting part, is that it's going to happen. It has to happen. And that's a fact. Like, there's no get-out-of-jail-free car, bro. None. Like, that is a life that I don't know. I don't, I don't have that ability Or I have the ability, I don't have the, um, I'm not good enough, smart enough. I'm not talented enough to do that. Some people are. Some people can start at one. Some people don't have to start at all. If you lack talent, you can't sit back and say, Mm. I'll start in half an hour. I can't do that. I got to start now. And after I get back from starting, I got to start again. And then when I get done with that run or that study session, if it wasn't good enough, I got to go back again. Because repetition is what, is, is, is what taught me everything. So you can honestly outwork anything. But it's that you obviously are a very talented man. Well, I, I have worked hard at certain things and built up some things that I've been good at most of my life. You're amazing. Yeah. Right. Look, gathering, Truly. organizing, and disseminating information is something I've been doing since I was a little kid. I used to give lectures at school on Monday about s- stuff I learned over the weekend. See, check that out. But they they took me to a psychiatrist. We're the same age. Back then, if you got sent to a psychiatrist, oh, meant people thought you were crazy. I wasn't one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was one. Exactly. So, <laughs> so I remember feeling like a freak. I also, I didn't have a stutter, but I had a grunting tick. <clears throat> it comes back when I'm tired. And the only thing that helped that was hitting my head on something shaking my head, which is why skateboarding was good because I'd slam and I'd feel like, oh, feel good. That's not healthy. You know, that's not good. Or just work, work is what gets it out. It's like an, it's like a RPM or high, Mm -hmm. you know, anyway, that's me. The, but yeah, I think certain things over time, I feel like talent or gifts or whatever you want to call them, but there are many things that are exceedingly difficult for me. And I, and I have learned from your example. I know that you, you are very, both humble and very clear that like, you don't have, you say, I don't, you're not going to get it by examining you. But I think the way you're sharing today and the way you shared on other podcasts before, there are pieces that really help people feel into the process of what you're talking about. Today, we're elaborating on it, I think, a lot. You know, this notion of being haunted and the stick. Right. I mean, of course, of course, now it makes so much sense why you don't want to talk about sleep or rest or recovery because that's... N- Sure, that's important. I've heard you say, yes, you sleep. Yes, you eat. Yes, you hydrate. Yes, you you will stretch your psoas or whatever. But it's funny how that becomes the viral message. That's why I said fuck that today. But that's not the unique, that's not the, the unique message that you carry. Like anyone can talk about that. So do I have that right? That you're acknowledging sleep is important, recovery is important, yes. but that's not what you're about. You have to forgo something. Yes. Ice baths. Saunas, sleep, nutrition, all this shit so fucking important, dude. I don't have time for some of it. To get, to extract what I had to extract, something had to give. Like you talk about you when you were younger, you would 
you would give these speeches and stuff. The same age you were giving speeches, I was trying to figure out how to say the without stuttering. And I realized as I got older that all these things are important. But for me to stop stuttering, I got to build fucking confidence. And speech therapy didn't help that. Nothing helped that. I have to forgo a lot of shit to be as fucked up as I am to build confidence. For me to stand in the fucking room of 10,000, of one person, and not and be like, oh, let me put my head down, let me look around, let me, let me um, read these paragraphs first, and then before I read the paragraphs, because they call me next, let me just leave the room kind of stutter. That's a miserable life. And that's one of many things I did, besides lying, besides being insecure, besides being immature, besides being fat, besides being one of the only black kids in my school. There's a lot of things I had to overcome to gain confidence. And in doing so, a lot of that had to go, a lot of it. So I became the guy that became once again misunderstood. You only sleep four hours a day, two hours a day. Sometimes you don't sleep at all. Like, what's this and what's this and what's this? I know it's all important. I can't, something's gotta go. For me to get confidence, because confidence is the building block of where I'm trying to go. For me to gain confidence in myself, this fucked up kid has got to do a lot of fucked up shit to gain confidence. And along the way, the stutter went away and I gained confidence. And now my life is a little bit more, there is no balance. There is no balance. It's a little bit more what it should be for a lot of people, but there'll never be balance because confidence is something that you constantly, confidence and belief, you're building every day. And so something's got to give. And I'm willing to forgo a lot of things to have that because I know that is, that is, if you want to give somebody kryptonite, take that shit away from them. So yeah, I, I don't sleep sometimes and sometimes I don't eat the right way and sometimes I don't do this and do that and whatever, man. But you put me in a room with 10,000 people any time of the day and I walk in there thinking I'm the best motherfucker in here because I know what it took to be on this stage and a lot of people will not do that. So that's what it takes. There's a question I've been wanting to ask you since we started and I thought about coming in here and I've been thinking about in the weeks ahead of this and I'm going to just come clean and say I don't exactly know how to ask the question. Just ask it. So it's about relationships. Oh, do it, man. So I know in myself mm -hmm. that my discipline is much higher when it's just me, but that's because I had certain things early on, but then I had, I was a terrible student, barely finished high school. But then when I got serious, I got serious, but I did that by staying away from everybody. And anyone who's ever had a relationship of any kind, but in particular romantic relationships, knows that, yes, you can derive tremendous support from those. Like, you got this, baby. You can go and you're like, yeah, I got this. <laughs> she said, I got this. You right, know, right. It feels great to finish something and share with someone. Share a meal, you know, get the hug. But there's another side to all of that right? that I'd like to learn more about from you, which is there's a warm body next to you mm -hmm. in bed in the morning. You don't want to get up. Mm -hmm. They also have needs. You've got your mission that people sometimes need things from us, right. but also oftentimes the people that love us most, that truly love us and that want to support us, don't understand this thing. Mm -hmm. And they're the first people to tell us like, listen, take a day off. And then this whole cycle, at least in my head goes off, like you just want a vacation. And then it's almost like a paranoia. I'm not saying anything nice about myself right now. Right. Oh, good, man. Former girlfriends are going to be like, yeah. Like, you know, that they remember. They so and, and so support of people close to you is critical. Mm -hmm. This could be friends, could be romantic partners, whatever. But they're also, the, the knife cuts both ways. Yep. It can be the thing that can really undermine this thing that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because the people that care about us also want to see us comfortable. Right. They want to see us happy. They want to see us peaceful. They want to see us in a, wake up from a great night's sleep. And they want things too. Right. So how do you untangle that whole bit? Well, it's funny, man. I'm, I'm unbalanced, but I'm mostly unbalanced towards the family side. People don't get about me. I start being unbalanced. I get all my stuff in. But what I do is I make sure that my family has everything they need. Everything they need. Those who want to be part of my family. Some don't. 
Some family members don't want to be part of David Goggins. I get it. I got it. That's life. Those who are part of my family, I give them everything they need so they can leave me the fuck alone. I make sure you're happy as fuck because I got to go to work. And I don't mean smoke jumping. I don't mean running. I mean all of it. It takes every, I can't have you in my fucking shit. Can't. So I know for me to have a family, I got to make sure that you realize I'm going to give you everything you need. So when you start bitching at me, I'm going to say, look, hang on. I dedicated my life to give you everything you need. I need this time right here. For me to be the best I can be because this journey started without anybody. And I make sure everybody knows that who comes in my life. I've been left, think about it. I was left alone at a, long, at, at a young age to figure this shit out. I figured it out for myself. And it's been very successful for myself. No one's going to come in here and fuck with my shit. That's why I make sure I will take care of whatever you need. Whatever you need from me, you got it. Money, house, my love, my support. I'm going to give you everything you need. That said, I do it the highest level possible. And I'm saying it with Jennifer in the next room. So please come here and say something. If it's wrong, Jennifer, I don't give a fuck. Say what you got to say. So then when it's time for me to go to work, I expect you to do the same for me. Because it takes every bit of me to do what I have to do. So I make sure that I'm very unbalanced for my family so I can be exactly that unbalanced for myself. And that's how I do it. I let people know right up front, I'm not what you want in a man. I guarantee that. There's going to be a lot of late nights, a lot of early mornings, a lot of times where I got to be by myself thinking about the process that is next in my mind. I can't have aggravation, I can't have this, can't have that. There's a lot of things, but I let them know up front. I'm very vocal about that. Sometimes relationships work for me, sometimes they didn't. But that's who I am. One thing I did wrong in my life was I tried for so many years to please people. And I did it at the expense of myself. I was leaving a lot in the tank. And, I, and when you do that, you stop living. But the person in your life is happy as fuck because you're giving them everything they want. They have their, their, their life is full, but you feel empty. And that's not a relationship to me. So for me, it's important that you know exactly who I am because this is what life made. And I'm not trying to change it because I just figured it out. So I'm not trying to compromise David Goggins. I will never ever compromise David Goggins. That doesn't mean I won't give you what you need and what you want and what you desire. But I don't need money. I don't need fame. I don't need shit. So I give it all away. What I do need is to make sure that that willpower is worked on every fucking day and every night for the rest of my life. Because that's the one thing that's going to keep me feeding you, keeping you where you need to be. Because once that willpower is gone, 300-pound David Goggins, he may not be look like it, but I will walk around with it. So the things that are important to you in life, you must do always or you're nobody. And that's how I handle relationships. Amen to that. Something I could personally work on is that upfront, clear communication. Because I, I, it resonates that feeling of like there's something inside that's not getting worked out that I was when I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a lot easier. But then, of course, wanting relationships and family, I think that's a healthy part of being human too. Very and obviously, you've worked it out. So I appreciate you sharing mm -hmm. that. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about no, it people that are way scared before. Of that, man. People are scared of that conversation with their wife, husband, girlfriend, boyfriend. And, but why are you scared of it? Why are you scared to tell a motherfucker, your wife, your husband, who you are? Who you are, exactly who you are. And that was the problem I had. That's a problem that a lot of us have in life. No one knows who you really are. No one knew who I really was. I went to a school where there were a lot of black kids. A lot of black kids didn't want to be in special ops. I never talked about special ops with black kids. Why? I was wondering what, man, I'm not going to fit in. That's not what they do. A lot of black kids don't do that kind of shit. So I, 
whatever I wanted to do, no one really knew the real me growing up because I never want anybody to know the real me. I was always afraid of what you might say or how you're going to feel or whatever. You got feelings. You have a life that you have to live. So it's important that whatever's on your mind, you let that person know. Therefore, you're giving them the option to be with you or not. This is who I am. If you don't like it, that's good, man. I, I got it. But this is David Goggins. So there's that, that honest conversation is very important, man. So everybody knows where they stand. That person may not be for you. And that's all good. This world could use a lot more of that upfront, completely honest conversation. I feel like so much of the world's problems are because everyone's dancing around these issues. It takes a lot. Recently in the news, seeing people losing their job because they won't say something publicly. You can tell they kind of want it. It's like and people just, I think, deep down really crave the direct message. Like, what are you about? What are you not about? But I think now everyone's afraid of getting canceled. It's a big deal, right? You know, getting canceled that people think, oh, I can't work if I am who I am or, or um, if I'm not pretending to be somebody else, then, you know, silence is considered, you know, agreement. You know, there's all sorts of complicated stuff. And I, I do feel for the generation coming up because right. we didn't have social media right. and all of that, that getting just walled off from that, there's a real benefit from just not paying yep. attention. People love to lie. People love to lie. You know, I thought I was the only person growing like, like when I was growing up, I thought I was the only person that lied because I live in the bubble. And people love to lie about who they're not. They love to lie about who they're not, dude. And that's, for me, the reason why I'm so vulnerable and I'm so real and honest, find somebody to come out and tell me I'm lying about my fucking life. And for me to come where I came from and have the resume I have now, you know the confidence you get? How I don't care who you gonna you gonna judge me? You gonna judge me? What have you done in your life? So me being so honest and so upfront and so truthful, that came with me finally figuring out who I was, but also conquering David Goggins, the demons of David Goggins. Therefore, now you're just an open book. You look at somebody looking right in the eye, tell them exactly who the fuck you are. You walk away. I'm good, bro, because I know exactly what this journey took to get here. And that gives you a fire and a passion that people can call you nigger. They can call you if you're a lesbian or gay or bisexual. Call you whatever the fuck you want. If you put yourself in the fire and you come out every fucking day like this, brush it off, not scared to go back in there again, come on, man. Your truth is real. You come out every day, man, with a way of talking to people that people don't have. Because there's no truth behind them. And the truth is a starting line. When you sit in the ugly mirror and say, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, you finally started your life. Maybe 40 years old. Maybe 40 years old. Five, six kids, wife. The second you look in that mirror and you say, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. Well, basically, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. I can't do this, I can't do this. I'm all these insecurities. Your life finally started. And once you start that life, man, the truth comes out big time. Cause you don't care. So that's the problem. Most people just don't want to have that conversation to the point where they can go on stage with a million people and say, I'm all of this and have a good day. See ya. It's, it's, it's empowering. It's very empowering. I feel like the, the way we're educated in school, but also outside of school, as we're are trained as human beings, these young brains, to try and figure out how to get positive feedback from other people. Yep. It's like we're we're like little dogs. Yep. You have a bulldog. That's right. I had a bulldog. Saw the picture of your bulldog. She's <laughs> she's great. They're Charlie they're, Dog. They're an amazing species. They are. Uh, I think of them uh economy of effort. Yep. Or amazing breed, excuse me. Yep. They're an amazing breed. Economy of effort. They yep. don't do anything unless it's necessary. <laughs> it's kind of the exact opposite of everything it's we're talking about. It's yeah. kind of interesting that, and it they're is. kind of hedonist. Yes. Now it is true that they will, they'll die to protect you. Oh yeah. And it's an instinct. Yes. I saw that with Costello. I'm sure that. I saw it with Charlie. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's an instinct. But if they're not in that position, mm. if there's no need to exert effort. They're resting. Yeah. So your bulldog's resting for you. Yes. Got it. Exactly. So you don't need to rest because. Active recovery, Charlie. Perfect. That's it. Perfect. That's going to be your answer from now on. Active People go, does Charlie. he sleep? Does he rest? Go, no, he somehow worked it out so his bulldog does it for him. Right. But we're 
sort of indoctrinated into this way of being from a time that we're young, where, of course, praise feels good, right? Someone tells you, hey, I like that shirt or good job today or nicely done. Or I, for me, because I like growing up in a big pack of friends growing up and I was never the greatest athlete, wasn't terrible, wasn't great, et cetera, like a fist bump or like a feeling crewed up. And you're just like, yeah. But you've talked about this before in reference to the SEAL teams. We both know a lot of people in that community and the team's component is a big part of it for a lot of people. And it's a wonderful thing. Right. But there's a danger to that dopamine hit, for lack of a better way to put it, from what we only derive when it's coming from outside. You're talking about being able to either say good job, but also like just look to one's own personal history and say, I, I've done hard things and I can do it again and again because I do it again and again and again. You're talking about parenting yourself, yep. inspiring yourself, yep. scaring yourself, yep. all of that from the inside. Yeah. So very different than the way we're raised, which is to figure out how to get the biscuit. It's funny, man. People want to know how I'm always motivated. It's the unseen work, which you just said is a true statement. Those are false dopamine hits that people are giving you, man. There's no belief in that. These are team work dopamine. Like, I'm out running at 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning, in the gym, long sessions by myself. You, That's real. How I'm able to just extract dopamine the good dopamine whenever I want. Man, I've trained 99% of my life alone. No one pat me on the back. I did all of the work alone. And while I'm still hard on myself, I know what I did. So whenever times get bad for me, people, all this, who's gonna carry the boats and love? That's real. I hate that people know me for that guy because that guy is not every fucking day. Like when they see me, they want that energy. That's not me every day. I can extract it immediately when I need to because when you train alone and I lived alone for so many years in this misery and you're able to get out of it by yourself, I can take myself to such a level of real, real passion and purpose. And like the feeling I get is something I can't even explain by myself. I don't need anyone. That's why, that's why people come to me to motivate them. No one can motivate me. I have a resume full of fucking motivation that whenever I'm down, I'm like, oh, hang on, motherfucker. Oh, you know, you know the truth. You know the truth. You know the darkness of the fucking dungeons and the fucking demons that fly. You know. And then from there, it's like, oh, okay, you were there. You know this. There was no one there to pick up the rucksack, to pick up the boat, to pick up the log, to go in there. It was you. It was you. There was no pat on the fucking back at 300, at, at 275, at 250, at 220. No, that was you. So those things that come out of me, that extract from me in the darkness, people are looking for that pat on the back. Where is it? Oh, I don't need it. Because what I've done is in the fucking unseen work, I built Frankenstein. So whenever shit gets nasty... David Goggins goes, you had nobody anyway, motherfucker. So see how I'm talking myself right now? That's me. That shit fires me the fuck up. That shit makes me fucking nuts. You had nobody anyway, motherfucker. Look around you. There was no fucking team. It was you. There was no weight loss program or mom and dad waking you up saying you can do it. You can be better. Trying to build belief. You built belief when you had nothing. Rock bottom. You did that. So as times get hard for me, the truth comes out. And my truth is powerful as fuck. It's real. It's tangible. I feel it. It comes out of my brain as I speak about it. I'm reliving every single dark moment of my life to be here. So that is what people don't get. That is what motivates David Goggins is the unseen work, but everybody needs that pat on the back. They need that training partner. They, they need that accountability coach. I don't need that shit, and neither do they. But it's what we've trained ourselves to believe that we need. It's almost like there's this pill on the shelf 
I'm speaking in analogy. Right. And we take it and we get jazzed up. We're like, yeah. But there's this other medicine cabinet behind there and it's in us. That's You're right. saying the, the real medicine cabinet oh. is inside. Oh, yes. When you continue to overcome, and I had so many obstacles to overcome. So it's actually a benefit to me, but the benefit is not like a benefit like that. You have to have the courage and the patience to overcome and overcome. Before you know it, man, you have a whole medicine cabinet, but there's no medicine in the motherfucker. There's no pre-workout. I don't take none of that shit. All I got to do is flip my brain, put my finger in there and say, okay, that's a good one. So all I got to do, man. I got the Rolodex of just like, go fuck yourself, Goggins. And oh, but you won. Let's do that one today. There's nothing I need. And this is the thing that people don't get about David Goggins. I can't teach it in a one minute video. We all have this ability to have our own medicine cabinet. But unless you go in there and put the medicine in there, it's always going to be fucking empty, man. You're always going to need the pre-workout. You're always going to need to, I don't drink coffee. I don't do, I don't do none of that. I don't need it. I, I can run for 70 hours and I had before. No caffeine. I got all this wonderful shit that I overcame on my own, by myself, in the darkness. That man, when it's cold, I'm hot. When it's hot, like, I, I, I can feed myself all the time. And that's why when people say, man, why aren't you missing anything? I can't explain it to you, man. Can't explain it to you. you you'll, you'll never understand. That's why I don't do all these podcasts, dude. I, got, I, I, I love you, man. That's why you, my first book, you did a blur for me. That's why I'm here. I love what you're doing for people, man, but I can't explain this. I can't. I can't explain this because people don't want to do this. They don't want to do this, man, but it's, it, I don't know, man. I get, I get jazzed up even talking about it, man, because so many people think my life is just so, oh, God, his life is horrible. Like, don't, don't follow him. He's crazy. Really? But there are a good number of people, I would say, and that's yes. an understatement that actually there do. Are. I think it. I what I'm hearing today, and it's really sinking in, is that a great many people either partially or completely misunderstand you. Yes. Big I, time. I'll put myself in the partially category. Big time. Because I thought it was about just like forward center of mass, carrot, 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 carrot. But it's the stick. It's the stick. And it's being haunted. And, you know... I do have examples from my own life, which is not what today is about, about being really afraid and then turning things around. Right. My biggest fear is getting comfortable. Right. I do not have as much of a stick-oriented approach, but today's conversation's changing the way I think. I'm not going to step away from this and think, okay, there are 25 neural circuits that can explain 10 of the things that David's talking about. And what I'm thinking about is the fact that everybody has a brain. They have a mind. Forget the brain. The brain is just the physical structure. But what that manifests, what that creates is the mind. And everybody has that. So I do believe that everyone has the capacity to do what you're talking about at some level. I also will be the first to confess that I think you're a highly unusual, let's just say, maybe even N of one, as we say in science, sample size of one. Right. Right somebody who has created this process for themselves and keeps them in this, themselves in this forward center of mass with the stick battering the back of their head mm -hmm. all the time. Right. Highly unusual. But this internal medicine cabinet that you're talking about building up true confidence, not needing anything from the outside. I think, I like to think mm -hmm. that people want that. They want to be known. Mm -hmm. They're afraid, but that they want to be known for who they really are and that you're describing the path to do this. Right. And I will say, I'm immensely grateful that you're talking to us this way today about things that you've talked about before, but we're hitting it a little differently, yeah. I like to think. Very different. Because what you're talking about is a process. It's verbs. It's all verbs. All action. And it's not about success. It's more actually about keeping that friction dialed to 10. Right. And that I, no energy drink, no supplement. People often misunderstand me. They think, 
You know, like I'm big on people getting sunlight in the morning so they can set their circadian rhythm and get better sleep, so they can, et cetera. But then people always think they go straight to the supplements. Yeah. What should I take? You know, and then of course people think I'm all about supplements. And supplements are one piece for me, but it's like tiny fraction compared to the the doing, the do's and don'ts. That's why I didn't want to talk about that today. That's why I'm glad we're talking about this. This is it. This is it. Like the brain is the most powerful weapon in the world. And it's it's crazy how a kid that wasn't real smart, I was forced to go only internal. External had to go away. The external world had to go away. And living so deep inside myself, it was me in this brain and figuring out how this thing works. And it's so many people are doing exactly that, the supplements, the this, the that. And I agree, it helps. But once you figure out your your brain, you become unstoppable to almost anything. Yeah, you can't beat death. You can't whatever, whatever. Your brain is amazing. Once you feed it the right conversation, the right mental nutrients, the right mental supplements, the right, the right internal dialogue at the right time with the right hit, with the right proof of what you've done in the past, and you send that right to the right circuit, dude, you're a fucking beast. A beast. But once again, you just can't read about it. You can't sit back and be a theorist. You have to be a fucking practitioner. And in that practice is where that becomes proof positive. What I'm saying is like, God, like David Goggins, he's blowing my mind. What is this? He's not crazy. And so many people, a lot of people, have listened to me the right way and they come back and they're like, I'm totally on board. I, it, it happened. It happened. I'm like, it'll keep going, man, if you keep doing it. But that is it, man. There's no sun. There's no glory. There's no carrot. There's no victory but there is all of it in one. I can't explain it real well to people, man, but what you get the other end is something that you're not, you're always found. You're never lost anymore. Doesn't mean the journey's easy. Doesn't get any easier, but you're always found. I love that. I just want to hover on that for a sec, the same way we hovered on Haunted and mm -hmm. the Stick. I think people feel lost. I've certainly felt lost at times in my life. Um, many times and yeah there's that thing i don't think there's a neuroscience or a psychology term for it someone will say put it in the comments and say oh yeah that's what so and so said but like you said we're not trying to be theoretical here we're trying to be practical the business of finding yourself and knowing like oh. but it's sort of like i'm safe because i'm in danger and i've been in danger before and i got myself out it always always seems to come back to verbs again i don't have a language for this you know, for once I'm lost for words. <laughs> There's like, a, it's, it's about a, a process, the algorithm. And you and the reason here, I'm just kind of trying to make sure I'm understanding things correctly. One of the reasons why it must be uncomfortable for you to be who you are publicly is because people want to focus on the running or the swearing. And by the way, the swearing is, is welcome. I'll tell you, I came up through laboratories where all three people I worked for swore a lot. But there was one rule. I couldn't swear at people. So my graduate advisor, brilliant woman, unfortunately, she died early. They all died early. I'm the common denominator. I had that internalized for a long time. Right. Anyway, she said, but if you swear at people, you're out. Right. But you can swear as much as you want. So that's, that's the rule I have. It's like you can swear as much as you want, just don't swear at people. And if you right. swear at people, better be ready to fight. Right, right. I'm definitely not going to fight you. So you can swear at me, get away with it. But the fact of the matter is that it must be frustrating. Mm -hmm. That people, because I know people go, oh, it's, a, it's all about supplements and ice baths. Right, listen, I like supplements. I love supplements and ice baths. But that's right. not the full picture. It's right. just a gravitational pull. It's the swearing. It's mm -hmm. the running. It's his feet that are all messed up. Yeah. It's the fact that he got a Triton. Yeah. He's this SEAL guy. Yeah. We talk about that too, yeah. right? You know, and there's a gravitational pull for people. And they're missing like the, that's like the tip of the iceberg is what I'm realizing. I'm realizing that today... Thanks Small to the way piece. you're phrasing things, because the bigger vessel is all in here. And, yes. and as you said, how do you put that in a book? 
It, it, it's impossible. Because it's highly individual. Yes. You do it your way. Yes. And you're saying everyone needs to go figure out how to do it their way for them. Yes. And the thing about being misunderstood is very frustrating. More than I can even imagine. I, I can't even ex express how frustrating it is. When the cussing and everything comes from a place of, of, of real. I can't explain what I do without it. The passion comes out of me. It's almost like speaking in tongues. Because when you put that much work and people go, oh yeah, there's been this basketball player, this football player, this. Dude, no, no. Everything, everything is work. Everything. And people don't, don't believe it. So when I speak, the motherfucker and the, and the fuck and, and, and the shit and, and it's, that is what it took for me, what it takes for me. The anger, the passion, the, 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 the jaw dropping, just, it, it takes that because I'm not that. This is how I look at it, man. What built this guy, let's imagine being in the coldest water you can possibly take. I always go back to Hell Week with this. I hate it. The water. Hated it. You're sitting there locked arms and you're in the water all the time. And they're bringing you in and out of the water. In and out of the water. When you have this dialogue in your head and these people are judging me off of a freaking one minute video and you're constantly your whole life, when you figured it out 24, that I gotta, I just, I just gotta, this fucking gotta, and this is just gonna suck. Every day is gonna suck. And live like that. To be better. And I put it this way. I'm in the water. The water is going over my head. The Pacific Ocean, you know, it's freezing. February, cold as shit. Been through three hell weeks. For you to constantly win, 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 when this voice over here, the real you, is saying, get the fuck out of here. Go. You're nobody. You've always been nobody. And it's true. People don't hear that. That's a true voice. That's the real reality of David Goggins at 24 years old. It's not a false reality. And then you had to create another voice over here that is saying you're better than that other voice. And you're in the freezing cold water that both voices don't want to fucking be in. But you win. And it goes from the water to the studying, to the running, to losing weight, to how you eat, to how you function as a man. Every day of your life, you're winning these battles. And then I have normal people who only have one voice. Never created the second voice. The winning voice is the second voice. They have a, one voice. And that's just, I'm a piece of shit. And that's all they hear. And then they judge people like me who are out here trying to be better. It's something that I can never really, it's a frustrating thing for me. Cause I know, I know the majority of people. I know what goes on in the brain cause I studied the mind more than almost more than you. Cause I wasn't, I'm a practitioner. So for you to be a piece of shit and come out of that, you don't just come out of it. You spend decades studying your mind in the human mind on how it functions in good environments, bad environments, stressful environments, patient environments. You studied all because you had to put all this together to create the mind to become successful. So I had to, it was like, God blessed me with this brain. I had to create a mind. And so in doing so, I figured out every piece of shit human being in the world because that's what I was going off of for myself. So I know why you go on Instagram. I know why you, because you just have the time. You have the time because you don't want to put that time into bettering oneself. So I know why I'm misunderstood. I'm misunderstood by people who have plenty of time on their hands to misunderstand me because they are exactly where I once was, which is a low life, lazy piece of shit.
And it's the harsh reality of people who troll you, who go after you. They have nothing better to do with their lives. It's not some after school special. It's the truth by once was that way. I know where it all comes from. That's why it's frustrating to me now because I'm not so frustrated at the fact that I'm being trolled. I'm frustrated by the fact that you don't have the courage, the courage to try to be somebody better than what you're not. And that's the frustrating part. It's interesting because earlier we were talking about relationships mm -hmm. and you said in a very candid way, and I really appreciate you sharing that, that you make sure that the people close to you, your family has everything they need. Right. And that they also understand that you're going to take what you need to continue to build you. Right. Period. Period. In some ways, it seems you've also included the general public in that family. Mm -hmm. You're saying, listen, I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to give you as much of myself as I can, except I'm going to stop right at the line. That's right. That if I were to cross it, is going to prevent me from continuing to build myself. And by the way, this relationship only exists because I don't cross that line. That's right. And I think as much as there are detractors out there, or people that try, uh -huh. right? I mean, it's pretty, whatever they're doing is pretty feeble in my mind. I mean, it's like cap gun fire, you know, yes. if, if that. Very feeble. You know, so many of us, men and women, old and young, hear something and feel something in your message. Well, like, yeah, like it seems kind of crazy. Gosh, like, doesn't he ever just relax? You know, what about his sleep? You know, yep, the, you know the, look at his feet. He's going to he's gonna injure himself. I've heard, listen, I'll be very direct. I got friends who are in the teams who just go, yeah, what's he going to do when he can't run? And I know the answer is keep running. That's right. Right. But it's more comfortable for people, mm -hmm. even high achievers. Especially to, high achievers. To believe that if you took one thing away, that it would all go away. It's absolutely clear that's not the case with you. I'm 100% convinced. I just know that because what we're talking about is this. You know how many times I haven't been able to run? Two heart surgeries, multiple knee surgeries. And after every knee surgery, they say you're not going to run again. And I'm fine with that. There's no running up here, bro. None. This was what it was all about. That's what they lost. What if you can't run? Give a fuck. It was never about running. Why do you think I run? It's the worst thing. I, I hate doing it more than anything. Hence the willpower. Right. Your anterior mid cingulate cortex Hence would be, would start to regress if you loved running. Think about it. Every day I wake up, I don't just run a mile, two miles. It's the one thing I hate the most to do, and I do it like I love it. 250, 60, 70, 300 mile runs at one time, no sleep. And every step, when I get to the, think about this, I get to the fucking start line. Cussing at Jennifer. Why the fuck am I here? I hate this shit. After 70 some hours of running, every fucking question I ever had is answered. Every question I had is answered. I cap success. I don't, people go, we mean you cap success. For me to be who I am, so when I go smoke jump, I smoke jump three to four months out of the year, sometimes five. Could you, just for those that aren't uh, educated, about, uh, just like give us a brief description of what smoke jumping entails. So basically you, you jump into fires, not into them, but you jump by fires that people can't get to. So out of planes and helicopters. Right, out of planes. Fast like lines. Parachute, yeah. it's, it's all parachuting. Mm -hmm. So you parachute out of airplanes and then you fight the fire. You and sometimes four other guys or maybe eight other guys, guys and gals, and you're putting this fire out. So I lose millions of dollars every summer to do this. It blows people's minds. Why the hell are you doing this? And you're breathing soot. I'm breathing soot, knees are jacked up, hitting the ground, hurting, whatever. Talking to normal people, they'll never get it, so I don't even explain it to them. But this is why I, I call it cap success. I'm talking financial success. For me to continue having that willpower, the second I just become a speaking monkey and travel around and speaking gigs 12 months out of the year, put camps on, do this, put on lectures, get supplement lines and do this and write more books and shit, 
I've ruined the exact thing I worked on my entire life. And while I didn't know it until the day, but something always told me, this is a very, very, very perishable skill, this, this willpower that you have, because I do have a willpower that I have never seen in anybody in my life. It is a haunting force that just keeps me going. And I know that that is my strength. If you have that, so that's worth every dime I've ever made in my life, is the fact that I can look a man in the eye finally and have a real conversation without going like this because I'm lying or I'm a piece of shit or I know, you know how a person and so many people do this shit. They're talking to you on who they want to be. They're lying to you and they walk away. I've done it so many times. You walk away like, God, man, why can't I just tell him the truth? Why the hell can I just tell him the truth? You know how good it feels for me now to look at you in your eye and every man, a man, I see. Because women won't get this. Women will not get this. Man to man. That man shit. You look another man in the eye and you know that everything you're fucking saying is real. And it comes from a real working place. Something that you earned. It's the best feeling in the world. You can say that actually happened. Yes. Like I know with certainty what I'm saying actually happened. Actually happened. Who I am and who I say I am, I am. No more lies. No more skirting the truth. No more bullshit. And that is worth every dime I've ever made in my life. And I, as I swear to God on that. Every dime I've ever made in my life, building who I built, so I cap success because I know that if I ever go 12 months out of the year and don't put several, every day I'm going at it, but several months out of the year, I go right back to ground zero, which means I'm just fucking... David Goggins. No Goggins. No Carrie Boats fucking logs bullshit. It's just pick up that fucking Pulaski and dig. Hey, get that fucking pump. Walk down a mile. Put it in the fucking water. Mosquitoes beating. You're just David Goggins. You're nobody. Because that's where my growth is. That's where my willpower comes from. And that's where it stays. That's why I talk to you now. And, and that, can I talk like this, dude? People don't talk with this kind of passion because it, it, it ain't there. It ain't there. They're, they're regurgitating some shit from 30 fucking years ago. I'm regurgitating shit from an hour ago. Hour ago. Come on, man. It's just be real. And I can't be on these podcasts. I can't talk to anybody without being real. I'll go away. I'll just go away. Because I, I, I can't give you what I want to give you. You said perishable skill. I think that's another word, set of words I want to highlight because skill implies behavior. And when we were just talking a second ago about the deep, true bedrock sense of confidence that comes from looking someone in the eye and telling somebody something that you absolutely know it's true because it happened, you're talking about actions, you're not talking about perceptions. You're not talking about what you believe happened. You know it happened. And there's something really concrete about actions. I mean, that's what's so interesting is we're talking about the mind, but actions are the manifestation of the mind. And, I, and the stuff that just stays in here, people die with that. It doesn't go anywhere. I, I Long ago, somebody said, you know, I forget what the context was. It was a neuroscientist. He said, you know, most emotions, like, they're just emotions. They're just in there. Like you don't have to do anything with them. Mm -hmm. And I think certain emotions you want to do something with. Right. But I think people forget this. They feel miserable, like they're going to dissolve into a puddle of their own tears. No one ever died from an emotion. Right. But they feel like that they overwhelm us as if it's a tidal wave. It's going to pull us under and drown us. It's so interesting to me because I think what people, listen, you have a gravitational pull. People can feel the energy. I think, yes, you're either completely badly or partially understood. There's only one guy on the planet that truly understands you. I think there's one woman, Jennifer, who probably understands you as much as anyone's going to. And then the rest of us are kind of grasping, trying to figure it out. Right. But you're saying go inward. Mm -hmm. So first go inward mm -hmm. and then it's actions. Inward and actions. Now the inward piece is something I'd like to just spend a little bit of time on mm -hmm. because there are a couple of characters from history, people that were in concentration camps. Nelson Mandela, 
I mean, I'm not sure he had Instagram in there. I'm pretty sure he didn't. That's right. And I don't think there was anyone coaching him on like, hey, you're going to get out someday. And actually, you're going to lead an entire country. I'm pretty sure that's not how it worked. Mm -hmm. He had to find it here. Mm -hmm. He had to find it between his ears. Right. And there are other examples, but that's an important one. So the process of going inward, does it for you, and here I will ask for suggestions because I think people want, there are those of us who want to build this skill. Right. Wall yourself off, mm -hmm. phone off yep. for big portions of the day, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Texting off the requests, the this, the that. Anyone that knows you knows that I, we've communicated a few texts, but most of it comes through a filter. She's great. She knows you, you know, and she knows how to protect your time. And that hurts people's feelings. People yeah. get mad about that. Uh, hey, God bless. God bless you, Jennifer. You know, cutting oneself off when you're in there, you say it's just you. And the voices that come up are not pleasant. And then at some point, it converts to action. Okay. How much, what is the process of picking the action? That's the piece that I feel like we, there's like a, a, a bridge to build here, if you can, if you would. So the action being like, like, so like what's next? Yeah. yeah. So what, like be, when you go, go to sleep at night, when that happens, you know what you're going to do the next day? It's pre-planned? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's, okay. it's always the same thing. You're not building it on the fly. No, nothing's okay. on the fly. Nothing. In me. So how it works internally for me is I'm, I, I put it exactly how it is. I'm an artist. And every day I'm putting, I'm, I'm painting Mona Lisa. Every day. And, but it's a different one. It's not the same painting. So every day I wake up, even though I do the same thing, it takes a different way to get there. So every day in my mind, I'm going through my mind. I'm just like, and a good painter will not just paint. He needs to create. And you can't create with phones and everything going around you. So you got to block yourself off. You only do two podcasts in a year. You block yourself off and you're, and you're painting this thing inside and you're going through all these different colors of paint and everything else. And you can only figure out the right painting if you spend the correct amount of time in your brain. So every single day, I'm literally going with my mind and I'm painting, I'm creating this, this masterpiece. And the masterpiece is always myself. And, but to do that, you cannot have any distractions. Because if you're talking to an artist and he's trying to think about the next painting, he, he can't. So it's impossible to listen to you and listen to what your mind and body are telling you we must do. So people don't do enough of. They don't do any of it. You're, they don't have passion. They, they lack passion, drive, determination because you haven't spent time with yourself. Your mind will tell you what is next. But you haven't spent the time to go, all right, let me just figure this out. You're looking for, let me Google this and let me Google that and let me, you're not going to find it there because there's billions of people in this world and they're all supposed to be individuals. But we have a pack mentality. That's why you're so fucking lost. Why am I so unique? I'm being exactly what the fuck I was supposed to be. I ain't follow shit. And when I did follow shit, I was like everybody else. The second I said, okay, man, hang on, dude. You don't like this. You don't like this. You don't like this. Who are you, David Goggins? Who are you supposed to be? Miraculously, all these things just, I, I couldn't even, the, the list of shit I had to do just, wham. It's like, fuck, okay. Wow. Once you sit down with yourself and say, okay, I don't want to be like, Michael Jordan or Jim Brown, they both were on my birthday. So I, I looked at their birthdays. Like, oh my, maybe I can be one of these. I can't. I'm going to be David fucking Goggins. And that looks like this. It just came. Everything flooded. So every single day of my life, there's a different thing that comes up that I have to do. But no one knows what to do because everybody else is following steps like the Republican and Democratic parties. I'm not political. Neither am I. At all. 
for this reason. Republicans are going to vote Republican. Democrats are going to vote Democrat. You're not even a human fucking being, bro. No way all you fuckers agree with all the same fucking shit. And I know I don't. So once you figure out yourself and who you are, all the answers come. So every night, a different painting is being painted. And it's a beautiful painting for myself. I'm like, okay, that's, that's it. It may look the same to most motherfuckers, but the end result is very fucking different. That's why my lounge, I if you look at what I've done in 49 years, it's more than most people ever do in their life because they were a race car driver. And that's what they did. They drove a fucking car. It's great. I was all kind of shit because that's exactly what the painting was saying to do. It's what the mind was saying to do. It wasn't saying to drive a car so then that race car driver didn't know what the fuck to do. He, he, he retires from being a race car driver and they're lost. People go, how, how are you still? I, I don't get it. Dude, you're never going to fill your list, but you never found your list because it never was presented in front of you because your head was cluttered with shit. Because you never just stopped for lots of minutes, lots of years, and just said, all right, it's me and you. Let it go. And it just, bam, it's right there. It's right there. I'm not a psychologist, as I mentioned before, but I'm going to venture a hypothesis here. Mm -hmm. I think that you've, mastered the process of internal dialogue. But when I say dialogue, I think most people think, oh, the, the inner voice, the, the, the chatter. But that's just one half of a dialogue. A dialogue is a two-way street. So I completely agree because I know from experience that when we go inward, oftentimes we hear things, if we're really honest with ourselves, it's like, oh, no, I don't want to think about that or that. Part. No. And then we start looking outward or we start trying to shift our attention or distract and there are a million reasons that are handed to us, excuses and uh, seemingly good justifications to be able to do that. But dialogue is a two-way street. And it hit me while you were just saying what you were saying. I was paying very close attention. And I realized David Goggins is talking about the voice that comes up, including the terrible stuff that no one wants to hear about themselves from themselves. But then he's also got the dialogue down where he knows the counter voice. That's right. He goes, yeah, you're right. And so I'm going to do this. Or maybe, no, remember this. You're in a dialogue, a two-way dialogue in there, not a one-way ch chatter dialogue. There are books written by famous psychologists about chatter, trying to shift your internal narrative. You're like, bring the internal, the internal narrative. That's what going inward is about. But it's not one voice. Again, there's a hypothesis. I'm not claiming to be all-knowing. Lord knows I'm not all-knowing, okay? But you've mastered the dialogue, and if there are three voices, strong, medium, and weak in there, you're, you're like, let's all come to the table. Right. So you've got a, a, a symphony of voices in there that are all you, that you know to be you, right. and you know how to have those conversations. You're not afraid to be in those conversations. And then you know which, what the outcome of that committee decision is, and you put it into real world action. And the world only sees the action. That's it. And only you can know your di internal dialogue. Mm -hmm. And only I can know my internal dialogue. And the only way to quote unquote know it is to spend a hell of a lot of time there. That's right. Okay. A lifetime. Got it. A lifetime. Like, Think about it. For me to be sitting here in front of you, you're not going to call... 300 pound eco lab guy to come sit here. You might, I don't know, maybe. Probably not. Probably not. Think about this. What we teach people is kind, kindness to yourself. Do you think if I taught myself kindness, and I agree with it, guys, so many people, so many people take me out of context, it's ridiculous. Take it however the fuck you want to take it. When I was 300 pounds, where do you think that conversation would have got me if I spoke kindness to myself? I'll tell you where it gets me. Right back to 7-Eleven, another box of mini chocolate donuts and a chocolate milkshake. That's the one voice. That's the one voice that most of us have that you're talking about. If you don't have a conversation in there, the other voice that you create that says, oh, okay, 
How does this look? It looks very ugly. That kind conversation for me went away a long time ago, which is why the dialogue is now, which you see a lot of action, because most people have inaction, because there's one person talking. And that one person is always leading you down the same path, the path that makes you feel very comfortable and happy with yourself. The second you create the other voice, there's conflict. There's battles, there's wars, there's defeat. One thing I learned, and I taught myself this, and people go, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm gonna try to break it down real quick. I didn't teach myself victory first. I taught myself failure. I taught myself how to fail. And people go, that's so depressing, is it? When you're 300 pounds and you can't read and write and you're fucked up, you know how many times you're gonna fucking fail on that process? So if you don't know how to fail, there is no victory. I never talked about winning because I knew the path to winning was gonna be years of failing first. So I taught myself how to fail properly. No one teaches you how to fucking fail. But if you're going out for insurmountable fucking odds that make absolutely no fucking sense, a black kid that can't swim, 300 pounds, gonna be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> okay. You better teach yourself how to fail first. Because if you sit in failure for too long, you will never come out of it. So the first part of my success was learning how to fail properly. And then eventually, I started getting a few victories. But that's what people don't get. When you have buried yourself in such a deep fucking hole, you better first talk about the failures you're going to have first. And that's when that other voice comes up. It tells you we got to do something, but it also tells you, boy, <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, Goggins. You're in for a fucking climb, bro. You're going to get your ass handed to you, made fun of, the outside noise, the inside noise. Both voices are going to be fucking telling you to go fuck yourself. You are in for hell, bro. I am. So I better learn to fail. So this is what you mean when you say that whatever anyone says, it's insignificant. Insignificant as fuck. Right. It's the cap gun fire because yeah. it's just like it, because the voice in your own head is, is far worse. The, the, and I should say, sorry, one of the voices yes. in your head. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm being very like detailed, almost surgical about that because I think this thing about inner dialogue we think is one voice. Yes. But you're making it clear it's many voices. It is. And the thing about it is you, you, you have to be really, and sometimes all the voices are telling you the wrong shit, man. But through years, years, not a podcast or listening to a book or reading a book, years of sacrifice, of suffering, of diligent, pinpoint fucking work on what you want to do for yourself. Not like, oh, let me just do a bunch of shit. Let me, I want to be in every task possible. No. Pinpoint what I want to do with my life. What happens is you have all these voices that are telling you you're fucked up and this is going to be hard. But for some reason, you put so much practice into you that you can ignore every one of them that are telling you you're not going to fucking make it and still be able to fucking make it because you have put the practice in that you know this is the process. It's such a daunting task that all the voices are saying no, but you still have the conviction that I know I can do this. And that's what it took for me to get here 20, 30 years ago, I had this 35 or whatever it was, 30 to 25 years ago, pipe dream. And ever since then, every voice was like, you're a fucking nut. But when you put that practice in every day, you lace them up. And I don't mean run. It's just a metaphor for life. When you lace them motherfuckers up every day, pretty soon you win. Pretty soon you'll fucking win. If you have the courage and the heart and the dedication and the mindset about everybody can go fuck themselves, I know what I know. I've listened to myself enough to know I know what I know. None of you can hear what I'm hearing. 
And that's what people don't do enough of. They don't listen to their journey. They listen to everybody else's shit. Before you know it, I'm crazy. But if I'm so fucking crazy, why am I so successful? How'd that happen? If I'm so misguided and, mis and fucked up and don't listen to him. Why am I the only one to do a whole bunch of shit? Why am I a trailblazer? Why? How is that possible? How can you be fucked up and also self-made the same fucking... It, 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 no, no. Obviously, you're not looking at the truth in front of you. The truth in front of you is it sucks. It's painful. It's fucking mind-numbing. And that is the truth. And that's why a lot of people don't like listening to me. Because this is what it takes. Creating another voice and sometimes going at it alone. All the time going at it alone. Because no one's going to believe in you. And that's that. What I'm about to say is not conjecture. And I can say that with confidence because I did a four episode guest series with a, a brilliant psychiatrist, a guy named Paul Conti, he's from Trenton. He's a Stanford, Harvard trained guy. He's also got a lot of street in him. He's had his own hardship, real hardship. He's brilliant. And he said something that I'll never forget, which is, you know, we think that the, the forebrain, the part of our brain that creates strategy, et cetera, is the supercomputer. He said, no, 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 no. It's like the supercomputer of the brain is the, is the, unconscious mind. It's the part of our mind that's co controlling most everything. And most people, unfortunately, don't do the work to understand how their unconscious is controlling them. And that's a scary thing, this idea like your mind is controlling you, you know, and I'm not going to get into the free will debate. I believe in at least some will. <laughs> I believe what you're describing and this internal dialogue I think you have access to your unconscious mind. You, by listening to the dialogue, going inward, we know this is true in sleep, in dreams, in meditation, and just by shutting out everything else, shutting out all the external noise, which is filled with things that pull us to it. Noise makes it sound bad, but it's, it's the gravitational pull of all the things that just allow us to distract ourselves without knowing that, you know, it's the ice cream, the have a cookie, the Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. The unconscious mind, this huge piece of the iceberg underneath that Paul calls the, the supercomputer. He's saying that with knowledge as a neurobiologist, psychiatrist, psychologist. I mean, he really knows. That's the piece that if one does real introspection, he calls it the cupboards. You got to look in the cupboards and it's often really scary what you find in there. And most people are just like, I don't even want to know the cupboards are there. But you're pulling all the cupboard doors open. And then you're, and I'm, you're extremely deliberate with what gets put into action. You're not just going, oh, like I'm pissed, so I'm gonna act pissed, or I'm you know, tired, so I'm gonna act tired. It's, you're picking very carefully what to do. And that's a process that I'm, I'm guessing came to you. Does it come to you as a, okay, it makes sense why running makes sense. It makes sense why smoke jumping makes sense. So it seems like a huge, portion of your time is spent understanding yourself and making sense to you. And so when people don't understand you, it's got to be extra frustrating Yes, because <laughs> most people don't understand themselves. So that we're all running around going like, you're this and you're that because most people are just unwilling to look inward. Right. And I'm including myself, by the way. Right. I mean, I've done a fair amount of introspection, but I I'm inspired today, that word inspired, but it's true, motivated to start going inward further. Because it is scary. It's like we don't know what's in those cupboards, and it's terrifying. Yes. Especially because we don't know. And those are the first ones to open up. And like you talked about, you got to go through those cupboards. I do spring clean every fucking day in those dark cupboards. Those, those, those dark cabinets are the ones I start with first. That's the real me, man. That's the real me. That's why I, I'm, I'm not ashamed. I don't hide. I used to hide. I don't hide anymore. He's exactly right. I, I don't know all the fucking science behind shit. I know what I know. That's why I don't listen to anybody anymore. I don't listen to shit. I think most people are full of shit. Because I know. I know the deep, dark secrets of those fucking cupboards. It's ugly, man. And every day I'm talking to them. Every day I'm cleaning them. I'm, I'm cleaning them and I'm talking to the same demons that came out of those fucking cupboards as I'm, as I'm cleaning them. Sometimes they go right back in them again. It's not easy. And this is why most of us just, why I am misunderstood. 
Because what comes out of those cabinets that I'm cleaning, sometimes they see on Instagram. Sometimes they'll see it in the pocket. Sometimes they see in this one. I turn people off. Open up your own cabinets. And then go talk about it. Let me see how pretty it looks. Let me see how pretty you sound. Let me see how put together your words are. I bet you a fuck or a motherfucker comes out because for you to go back in there again to clean the same fucking cabinet that the demon came out of, take some big balls, bro. To do it every day of your life. To go back in there and spring clean every day. Not once a fucking year. Once every decade. Every day you know it gets dusty. And every day you don't start with the with the victories. You don't go, oh, this is nice. Look at my, look at my I love me wall. Let me clean up this little dusty. No, nope. I go right for the things that are gonna keep me buried. And I go right there first, because if I don't clean those out first, the day doesn't start. So what he's saying to me is truth. And like I told you many times a day, I can never figure out how to explain this shit to people because I'm not neuro nothing. I'm just a guy that said, okay, we got to start in the dungeon and we got to stay here for the rest of our lives. For you to become successful, the dungeon is a place that has to be clean. And it's the scariest place to be. That's why I'm misunderstood because I'm speaking from the dungeon. That's why I am successful because I go there every damn day. And that is the truth what he says. It's the exact truth. Those cabinets are fucking dusty, dirty, and scary as shit. Broken glass, fucking dark, spiders, cobwebs, but most of all, your biggest fears. The biggest things that put you in the fucked up place you are today are in there. That's why we all like to keep them shut, even like to lock them up, act like they never happened. That's why you never grow. You never improve. You never have real conversations like we're having right now. Never. Never. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's not, no, 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 let's not go there. I talk to so many people who tell me that. Let's talk about this. Because they'll tell me, but they can only say it once. And they'll say it in passing. They won't get deep in the weeds with it. Like, you can't just clean it, motherfucker. You got to spit shine that motherfucker. You got to relive it. Every fucking detail of it. You can't just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah my dad beat me. And, they, you know, you know. It, it, it is what it is. Hey, it is what it is, motherfucker. It's, it's killing you. It's taking over your whole fucking life. But that's the conversation. Yeah, my dad, yeah, but I'm fine now, though. I'm good. Okay. All right. No, you ain't. You ain't fine. You ain't fine. This is, this is real talk. People don't want to have that. So your boy's right. 100% right. Scary as shit. It's scary as shit. But it makes you who you're supposed to be. And that's the test. We forget. We, we think we're supposed to breathe air and have kids and pay the bills and shit. Everyone, like, what, what's this life about? That made no sense. Being tested, my friend. Tests come when you have not studied. Tests come when you think that you're in a great place. That's, that's the test. The test is every day of your life. And most of us fail because we don't know why we're here, because we don't go inward to say, oh, you gave me a lot of shit to fix, man. And this test sucks. But then you start. David Goggins. I don't think I could add to that. I know I can't. Thank you for sharing what you shared today. I mean, as much as your process or anyone's process can't be completely understood from the outside, you gave us a real window into this thing, this process that you was, as you said, God put it on you. Mm -hmm. I believe in God too. People can believe what they want, but mm -hmm. I somehow your your life, God gave you these challenges early on, and then there was a point where you went internal. Mm -hmm. And like you said, 
you developed a skill, but it's a perishable skill. Yep. And you clearly live in the process of opening those cupboards, reopening those cupboards, trying to spit shine those cupboards, understanding that they're never ever really done, but that you can gain ground on them, right. that you can win day after day after day. And you really shared a lot of concrete things that I think I know people are going to be able to apply if they choose. Right. And I agree with you. I think most people will be like, whoa, mm -hmm. that was a lot. Yep. It's heavy. I think I want to just kind of bake myself in Netflix and Chex Mix yep. instead. But there's also the reality that there are men and women, boys and girls, who hear that and go, okay, and start cracking the, the cupboards open. Right. And I, I just know that, you know, for myself, I'm extremely grateful that you're willing to put it all out there. You're so brutally honest, so brutally authentic. That word authenticity gets thrown around so much. And I can tell you that for me and for everybody else, like that's what really what resonates. So whether or not you want to, whether or not it's the purpose behind it or not, you're lighting the path. So thank you. Respect. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me for today's discussion with David Goggins. To learn more about David and to find links to his two fantastic books, Can't Hurt Me and Never Finished, please see the show note captions. If you're learning from and or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's a terrific zero-cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast on both Spotify and Apple. And on both Spotify and Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review. Please also check out the sponsors mentioned at the beginning and throughout today's episode. That's the best way to support this podcast. If you have questions or comments about the Huberman Lab podcast, or if you have suggestions about guests or topics that you'd like me to cover, please put those in the comment section on YouTube. I do read all the comments. Not on today's episode, but on many previous episodes of the Huberman Lab podcast, we discuss supplements. While supplements aren't necessary for everybody, many people derive tremendous benefit from them for things like improving sleep, for hormone support, and for focus. If you'd like to learn more about the supplements discussed on the Huberman Lab podcast, please go to Live Momentous, spelled O-U-S, so that's livemomentous.com slash Huberman. If you're not already following me on social media, I am Huberman Lab on all social media platforms. So that's Instagram, Twitter, Threads, X, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And on all those platforms, I discuss science and science-related tools, some of which overlaps with the content of the Huberman Lab podcast, but much of which is distinct from the content on the Huberman Lab podcast. So again, it's Huberman Lab on all social media platforms. If you haven't already subscribed to our Neural Network newsletter, I encourage you to do so. It is completely zero cost and it provides podcast summaries and protocols in the form of brief PDFs of one to three pages. Things like deliberate cold exposure, a protocol for foundational fitness, a protocol for deliberate heat exposure, for managing dopamine, for optimizing your sleep, and so on and so on. Again, completely zero cost. You simply go to hubermanlab.com, go to the menu, scroll down to newsletter and click on the newsletter tab and you enter your email to sign up. But I should point out that we do not share your email with anybody. Thank you once again for joining me for today's discussion with the one and only David Goggins. And last but certainly not least, thank you for your interest in science.